We might be live right now, so let's just pretend to be engaged in talking. Oh, we right. might be live. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> this part gets edited out in the final mix. Oh, that's good. We're live! <laughs> With this kitty cat. There's a cat on the floor. Yeah, he's off camera. With this kitty cat. Come here, can I see you? Can I pick you up? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, things are happening? Well, hi. Hi. Welcome back to the Story Coach uh, Show. I'm Matt. I'm Cheyenne. And uh, Rose is out doing family stuff, so she couldn't join us today. But we are here with my bad cat and some scripts, which are hopefully much better than said cat. Maybe. <laughs> He really is terrible. I mean, look at him on the floor just doing bad cat. Yeah, he's a really sweet cat. All right. Well, our first script uh, comes from Reddit, where Matt Edwards has asked us to take, take a look at it, and we're going to dive right in. Ooh. It's a cold read. Uh, yeah. Figure out who's doing the voices, and let's hope this is good. Welcome Week, written by Matt Edward. Welcome Week. Welcome Week, written by Matt Edward. Kind of a quirky spelling on the name there. I'm sure that's intentional, but Matt Edward, like, that already puts me on guard. Is it one word? Is yeah, that it's one quirky. Name? Matt Edward. It's like reading something uh, written by a YouTube handle. Matt Edward. <laughs> and we are live, so... <laughs> that wasn't funny. <laughs> You're giggling. Did you do something fun to this? No. <laughs> Parking was... Frustrating. <laughs> Let's go, like, poor Cheyenne. Laugh uh, all that out. <laughs> I feel so sorry for your modeling and having a life. Mm. Yeah. No, uh, Angelo Lorenzo says, just wanted to say the audio is looking and sounding good on my end, so thank you, Angelo. Oh, good. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, Angela. Angelo. 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 I'm so sorry, Angelo. I'm sorry he's furious. I know. I'm so sorry. It probably just ruined your day. <laughs> God damn it. Interior, Ford Bronco, highway, day. All right, that already throws me off because I know it's implying that the Ford Bronco is on the highway, but that's, it's hard to wrap my head around that log line. Well, what if it was line. on like a small road? Or if it was on a back road? Nice. I would not know that that was on the highway. But they do it in the next line, so it already threw me off. <coughs> Rather than enjoying Matt Edwards' uh, good work. It just confuses me, and what I always like to point out is that there's always a reader, and the reader is always trying to desperately process these words as fast as they come. And sometimes people are boring and they over-explain something that doesn't need to be explained. Hmm. Or and sometimes people under-explain something that needs to be explained quite thoroughly. <coughs> like, yeah. if it says, we can see that this person is a third-level shiromancer, and he's with his girlfriend, I'm like, what's a shiromancer? How do I, what? But uh, that was a tangent, and let's get back into it. Four unsavory teens speed down the highway in the hulking metal shell of an early 90s Ford Bronco. Chandler, a shoo-in for a younger Ted Bundy, navigates from shotgun with a MapQuest printout. Parker, the driver, and a brick shithouse, glances at Chandler for direction. <laughs> Poor Parker. <laughs> well, now I'm curious, because brick, built like a brick shithouse... <laughs> Like, it's funny. If you're reading an old school <laughs> Mickey Spillane novel, ah, uh, she was stacked. She was built like a brick shit house, and that's complimentary because she's stacked. She's a brick house, mighty mighty, letting it all hang out. Right. Like so built like a brick shit house makes me feel like is he supposed to be square shaped, brick shaped, or extremely muscular? Maybe he's um. Just a stocky dude who, like... Well, we know he's driving, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, we know he's driving. No idea who Parker <laughs> is or what his deal is or how old they are. But we know he's a brick shit house. Or she. Or, yeah, or she. Parker could also be a woman, I guess. I'm confused. I'm very confused on the second line. Twin boys fight over a pistol in the back seat. They're distinguished by their hairstyles. Jamie sports a buzz cut, and Jake wears a thick mane. They go at it like children. 
Well, they are children. I also don't know how old these people are, or if it's, you know, two young men mm -hmm. driving two kids, or four people of the same age, except the people in the back seat are immature. And also, from context, I assume it's a water pistol or a super soaker or such. Mm -hmm. But it might literally be a pistol. Yeah, because twin boys makes me feel like, yeah, like they're, they're kids. This is something, and this is crude, I, I call it the, the hogasm. You know, your confusion doesn't come immediately. It's very rare that I read a single line, like third level shower master and say, I'm confused. But it builds gradually. There's like these little tickles of confusion. Mm -hmm. And then it explodes in this, what? I'm confused. So by the third line in, I've already had to do way more thinking than I want to do when I just want to be reading the script. Chandler checks on the twins in the rearview mirror. I'm not helping you if this thing goes off in here. I'll finish the job it started, or you two can bleed out for all I care. Okay, so it's a crime kind of thing. Mm hmm. Maybe Parker? Not in here. I'll pull over and kick your ass to the shoulder if you need to bleed out. Jamie concedes the tug of war to yeah. Jake, but keeps an eye on the weapon in his brother's lap. Chandler glances down at his sheet. Take Jamboree Road. Parker signals to get over to the next lane. Do you want to be Jake and I'll be Jamie? Um, how long is this supposed to take? No more than an hour if everything goes as planned. We end up dealing with some jack-offs. It could take us a couple more. You guys have a curfew? Jamie watches the gun rattle in Jake's lap. We're expected home by midnight. That's my very poor attempt at a voice. You're a voice actor. I, I can't keep up. <laughs> Chandler tries not to laugh, shaking his head. Parker steers the Bronco toward the exit. The vehicle coasts off the road. Don't we already say about that? Do we already say the line? Uh, uh, Am I Chan uh, Yeah, you're Chandler. I'm Parker. I'm sorry. I'm Parker and Jake. The Bronco passes a sign on the shoulder. State College University. Take Campus Road. Parker signals for the turn. Uh, let's get us a fucking payday, huh? Daddy wants a new PlayStation and a big-ass TV to go with it. The chat informs me that Brick Shit House is original term, and you get it. <laughs> but I don't, because I'm from New England and live in California, so I, I feel left out by that cool regional term. <laughs> Jamie continues to stare at the gun. Jake's oblivious. I'd start focusing on how we'll get the cash rather than what we'll spend it on. The only thing I know is I don't want to leave here in handcuffs. How about you? Jake rears back for a stretch and a yawn. Jamie lunges for the gun. His brother jumps to defend. Bang! A muzzle flash fills the car. <sighs> Give me the goddamn gun! Is anybody bleeding? Beyond the stupidity, they're fine. How about my car? Is it, is it all right? The twins look down at a bullet-sized hole in the floor. <gasps> the Bronco rolls through the main entrance onto campus. So that's two pages in. I, I feel like this is a successful scene. Mm -hmm. I get that these are four guys who are up to no good. They're petty criminals. They're not all that bright. And they've got very bro -y dynamics to each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old they are. They could be college kids or they could be in their 40s. Although I'm leaning toward, you know, white guys in their 20s because that's yeah. just what script protagonists tend to look like. What I think about is, um, like, Parker and homeboy. Was his name Charlie? Chandler. Chandler. He, uh, those two are, like, college age, and the other two might be, like, maybe, like, seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, I have to be home by midnight. And then, unless they're all in high school. It's possible. And, like, maybe the... Chandler and Parker are, you know, like seniors, and the younger boys are like, you know, like 14, 15 years old. We're doing a lot of extrapolating, and I feel like it's not the best use of our imaginary energies. Right. Be <laughs> so this just goes to show you why putting the ages in is, is so important. Right. I like that there are two brothers in the back. I like that the group dynamics are set. Mm -hmm. I like that Parker's sort of a bro -y, oh yeah, we're going to get a PlayStation, get fucked up. And Chandler's like, I'm very serious. I don't want to go to jail. So I feel like th th this scene does do a very good job of setting up those characters. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very confused, and it sort of lost my goodwill at this point. Mm -hmm. Exterior. Albion Dormitory. State College University. Day. A heavy bass beat rattles a dorm room window. Hmm. 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 Oh. <laughs> I was like, I was like... Playing a bass. Yeah, but you're, you were right. You're... <laughs> I'm just like... 
No, I, I, I feel that's fair. <laughs> Reggie, an unassuming stick of a teenager, sits atop a nearby picnic table, blindly scrolling through his phone. He traces the beat to a room on the broad side of his dorm. Samantha, a built bombshell, unclasps her bra in front of the open window. The support falls from her chest. Holy shit. Reggie makes a feeble attempt not to stare, obstructing his gaze through the parted finger, through parted fingers, but still glancing at the girl. So kind of, I'm not doing anything. Just minding my business, making a phone call. Nothing creepy. <laughs> he puts a, a phone to his ear. <laughs> Samantha, topless still, holds her compact in one hand and precisely guides lipstick over her lips with the other. Hey, can you hear me? Reggie plugs his ear opposite the receiver. I'm just letting you know I'm alive. Things are going. Samantha closes the compact. Her eyes drift to the voyeur below, but he's not a voyeur. Or, uh, she and Reggie lock eyes. Also, this has been bothering me. If a gun goes off in a car, everyone is deafened. Like, I know we're in a movie and gun logic doesn't really hold in movies. But, I mean, there's a reason why if you're shooting someone out of a car, you put the muzzle outside of the window. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. inside the car... Like, these guys would be not be able to hear each other. So, given that <clears throat> that would also exacerbate the fuck uppery and the inherent humor in this serious drug deal, that might be worth exploring. I don't know. <laughs> Shit. Reggie quickly turns away. No, not you, Mom. I'm fine. <laughs> Samantha covering her... It's making me laugh, so that's good. I think you're an easier audience than I am. <laughs> I think it's just funny that he's talking to his mom while he's staring at this. That is inherently Girl. funny. Samantha, covering her nipples with an arm, shuts the window and twists the cheap metal blinds shut. If she didn't want people to look, why is she outside? Of, why is she in her window? I don't know. I get na like naked in front of the window all the time. Well, <laughs> when people see you, are you like, and you shut it, or do you just be like, la la la? I don't know. I think in like her words, like, oh, I'll just put my back to everything and like. Okay. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> don't look. Slap. Opens blinds to see if you're still there. Reggie tur Reggie's attention turns to the surrounding world. Freshmen pass by in tight groups along the main pathway. We're getting along fine. I mean, they match me with a roommate, not a best friend. A girl jogs toward Reggie, wearing a smile. He shoots the same look back until she embraces a boy standing behind him. I'm doing my best. <laughs> Reggie looks down at his feet for oh, solace. Poor Reggie. <laughs> He's a lovable loser, which is a strong archetype. I get this, dude. Don't worry about me, really. Everything's great. I know I said fine, but I've changed my mind. It's all so great! He guards his eyes and speaks softly. I miss you. I, I love you, too. Bye. <coughs> I feel like this is too much choreography on what he's doing. I mean, it's an awkward phone call. As he hangs up, a warning chimes on his phone. 20% battery life remaining. Reggie pockets the cell as he hops off the table. He walks across the front of his dorm to a propped open fire exit. Reggie grabs the humanities book, keeping it ajar. Again, a lot of choreography. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm more interested in what's going to go down with Parker and Chandler in the car, and I don't really care that it was a humanities textbook. Mm -hmm. Interior, emergency hallway, Albion dormitory, continuous. The lonely corridor dead ends into a door. That's not really a dead end. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like you have a dead end at a door. <laughs> Reggie approaches. <laughs> Bang! The door flies open in his face, spilling forth two of his doormates, Chip and Dustin. Chip grips a soggy, paper towel, a soggy toilet paper roll, while Dustin weaves a joint between his fingers. I will say that this is actually very good writing, because it's writing to emotional effect. It's got clarity. Mm -hmm. And that bang was good, because I was expecting it to be the gunshot mm. from the gun we saw that, uh, that went off earlier. Right. And it's even the same sound effect. So... This subversion is good. So I feel like this writer really knows what he's doing. But I feel like there's too much stuff going on in the side that's causing me to go off and attack these silly little points. Mm -hmm. And even though like most readers aren't sitting next to someone on a YouTube live stream pointing out every little discrepancy, it is the kind of thing that kind of nags at you in the back of your head. Some people just kind of gloss over it, but then they're not paying attention to your exact words, which is also not what you want. Because I, I, I once was in a screenwriting group with a, there was a character named Lee and about half an hour into the read, someone said, wait, Lee's a girl? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, <coughs> she was described as a her a couple times, but in fairness to this gentleman, like 
I'm, I'm still saying like a lot. In fairness to the gentleman who didn't know that Lee was a girl or not, it was just ambiguous enough, and he had just blipped over that little piece. Mm -hmm. Reggie sidesteps the wannabe stoner. Zuh. <laughs> Keep walking, you fucking nork. The door shuts on its own weight behind him. Wannabe stoners is another weird term because I, uh... I feel like you're either a stoner or you're not. Yeah. It's not like a wannabe coke user because if you've ever lived in the city and had to get coke when you're not a coke user, it's a lot of phone calls. You find your friend who is the biggest stoner and you're like, Hey, Tom, uh, you're a pretty big stoner. Do you still have that coke guy? No, he's out of town and it's... It's awkward. I, I'm not a user, but I, I date actresses. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, I'm losing steam on this one. Reggie steps into the stocky <coughs> drug dealer's sights. See, what, what stocky drug dealer sights? Okay, this is just another thing that takes me out of it, because if it had been the previous scene, there's a stocky drug dealer. And Reggie steps into that person's sights. That's great. But this is making me use my inference again. And I hate using my inference. Using inference tires <laughs> me out. I just Wait, he just walked into the door? Yeah. Oh, so the guys that are there are drug dealers? No, no, this is a different character. <coughs> oh. Caesar goes to close his door, cash protruding from his grip. From context, I imagine that's Caesar is the stocky drug dealer. But just as I would like to know how old Parker is... <laughs> I'd also like to know that Caesar is a stocky drug dealer and has wh wh whatever. You want something, friend? And feel free to jump in on any of these voices. You want something, friend? Better. <laughs> <laughs> After a lingering, awkward silence, Caesar okay. shuts his door. Reggie continues down the hall to the end of his suite and a door marked with two name placards. Reggie and Anthony. Do colleges have name placards? I honestly don't know. Like in I my went head. to an acting conservatory. If, if you know if colleges have name placards, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> I feel like the stereotypical college has whiteboards on them. <coughs> and they'd be written in whiteboard. And again, feel free to chime in if you guys see something we're not catching or if we're really well, I being feel unfair. Like, I feel like if you... Um, I mean, unless they, like, personally got them made for themselves. That would be know, hilarious. You know? <laughs> that, that, that takes me back to... Something that is underexplained that would be over, should be more explained because I'd want to see a scene like Cheyenne. It's your first year at Rutgers University. You professionally printed a name placard for your door. <laughs> and my roommate. <laughs> is he down with it or is she down with this? Yours says future PhD. <laughs> Yours says future PhD. Cheyenne. Future PhD. Yeah, that would be funny. You'd want to explore that more. So if you have an idea that lends itself to exploration, explore. <laughs> but in this case, I feel like name placards is sort of... In, every so often I read a script and I feel like I'm reading something that happened in sort of sullen acquiescence to a note. Like, someone like me said, how do we know it's his dorm? And then they throw out, it's Reggie and Anthony. Man, he hesitates for a moment, taking a deep breath. <coughs> Is it the cat, the lingering around no, the smoke? I think I'm like getting sick. My horrible body odor? <laughs> it is your horrible body yeah, odor. You're, you're sweet. <coughs> Reggie's room, Albion dormitory. Anthony, a baby faced but athletic looking <coughs> lad, sips his beer with a smile. Two of his neighbors, Marty and Lonnie, bash on N64 controllers with bottles balanced at their feet. Okay, is this a period script? Because they're in a 90s Bronco. Mmm. Parker wants a PlayStation. That's true. And they're playing N64. Mmm. <coughs> Learning things. Yeah, and again, I'm using inference again, and I hate using inference. <coughs> I, I feel like I'm reasonably good at using inference. On other people's screenplays? Okay. Funny uh, Cheyenne story. When I met her, she was smoking a cigarette, and you're from the country. Yeah. Where there's a lot of cornfields and such. So the bad kids in the country tend to spit in the room so they can ash in that spit. So the errant cigarette ash doesn't like the cornfields yeah. set them ablaze. I'm also just disgusting. You're pretty straight. <laughs> 
Missouri. <laughs> Missouri. <laughs> um, Anthony says, you don't have to live with this fucking guy. Cry me a river. I doubt Reggie's that bad. Yeah, he's fucking terrible. If it's any consolation, Marty <laughs> locked me out once for like six hours while he was beating off. You beat off for six hours? That's a good technique. Uh, that's called calling it out. <laughs> Uh, rather than just letting six hours beating off, like, passing it on like it's nothing. <laughs> like, that, that, that's interesting, and I'm glad that Anthony had the same reaction I did. <laughs> so I think that's a very good <laughs> uh, he's, I didn't beat out for six hours. I beat off for ten minutes and then fell asleep for, like, six hours. I didn't beat off for six hours! <laughs> I'm amused. This person does comedy very well. I, I, uh, comedy is a very hard thing to do. <laughs> I beat off for like I beat off for like ten minutes and fell asleep for like six like, hours. Whether consciously or unconsciously, this person is using very good improv skills, <laughs> which is calling it out and justifying and then establishing character with the explanation. So I, I really like these three lines here. I think that's very good. Still don't know what year it is. <laughs> the next line is, I get tired when I jerk off. <laughs> I get tired when I jerk off. <laughs> And then I guess I'm Lonnie. Marty yeah. and I were past it. I know how to always keep my I know to always keep my key handy and not and 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 to knock before entering. There's a typo. Or maybe not. I'd probably kill myself if he caught me finishing. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> okay. The feelings mutual. See Anthony? That's what's called common ground. I wish it was that easy to remedy. I'm stuck living with that fucking rat. The twist of the doorknob acts like a starter gun. <coughs> Each of the boys slides his open beer from view, at least one of them toppling over and spilling onto the carpet. Again, this is where putting ages in mm -hmm. would have really helped because... I don't know if there are 18-year-olds drinking, which is different stakes than 21-year-olds drinking. Mm -hmm. But I do know... I do like how this scene, even though they're talking about Reggie, they're telling us a lot about him. Like, I don't like Reggie based on this description. I mean, these guys seem like obnoxious bros who probably eat yeah. them all night, but... And Reggie just kind of like, is he still here? Is he still in this room? Well, that's <laughs> where the choreography got kind of confusing. He hesitates a moment before keep taking a deep breath. Mm -hmm. So he's been like... <sighs> oh, oh okay, so this. he is like, oh, okay, I understand. And I'm not okay. sure if he's hearing this or not. Mm. I doubt he is. If you're just tuning in, we're reading Welcome Week, <coughs> submitted via Reddit. Uh, I'm Matt Lazarus. This is Cheyenne. Hi. You can check out my site, www.thestorycoach.net, and we are continuing. Thank you for attending. So, the, he's been outside, maybe hearing it, maybe not, which would have been nice to point out. Mm -hmm. What's up, Reggie? I'm sorry for bothering you guys. <laughs> I have like four voices. With it. <laughs> they're just they're just pitches. <laughs> I'm on a spectrum. That's fine. I don't think That's I, fine, I, I might be. Who knows? Some people can't like do things, you know. Anthony swallows a mouthful of beer. He slides a six pack under his bed with a gentle push of his toe. It's your room too. I'm just. Reggie points to the far end of the room, his side. I'm going to normalize his voice because he really feels like the protagonist now. Mm-hmm. I'm getting my laundry. Be my guest. He crosses in front of the television. How you doing, Reggie? <laughs> Reggie bear hugs his flimsy, loaded-up laundry hamper. There might be a need a hyphen in there. I don't know. Fine, Marty. You doing some errands? <laughs> you doing some errands? <laughs> yeah. So you'll... Be a while, then. Lonnie! Lonnie's roommate shoots him a what-the-fuck glance. Lonnie. The noob543 says, I wish I had a script to submit. Well, get on it. I mean, honestly, noob, I would suggest writing a short. Don't be a noob, noob. Just write something. You're so down with the least speak. <laughs> You remember when people said pwned? Did you? I was sorry to say, you just got pwned. I feel like pwned is like, now what, you know how soccer moms are very unhip? Mm, yeah. I feel like soccer moms say. five years away from a soccer moms <laughs> from this generation talking about pwnage. <laughs> you know what I just learned? 
I learned, apparently, I've got no justification, or I've got no backup on this, but <laughs> kids in L.A. are saying lit for... Yeah. Off the hook. Yeah. I've been saying that for months now. Jesus Christ. Should be lit. And then, like... <laughs> yeah. And then you say, that's fire. Like my mixtape is fire? <laughs> yeah. I know that one. I'm older than I look, and basically millennial stuff irritates me. You say, it like, did you get on that fleek train? I know that on fleek is a synonym for on point. <laughs> You're so, like, like very analytical about it. I'm, anyway, we need to get back to this. <laughs> do, do we have to? Like, the other thing is, I, I think what this is pointing out is I'm not terribly invested in this. Like, I love the technique, and I love what's being set up here, but the script lost a lot of goodwill for me when they failed to give the ages, and now... The fact that it may or may not be in the night or in the mid nineties, and now my mind is wandering to all the other things I could be doing or all the mm -hmm. other scripts I could be reading. So that's the penalty you pay for leaving things to the audience's imagination. And I know someone is going to come in and, and possibly say, <laughs> "Well, what about over describing?" And you don't have to. You shouldn't over describe, and you shouldn't spell everything out. Right, like uh, the humanities textbook mm -hmm. over describing, but leaving out someone's age, <laughs> that's, that's necessary. <laughs> Some free art says it, it's made a full cycle. <laughs> Prepare for the revival of tight. Wait, was lit a term? No. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Which I would also say that shit's tight. <laughs> well, I say that shit's tight because, look, sometimes things are tight. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> But wh whatever that original term is, please tell me some free art, because I want to know. <coughs> so Reggie, with his laundry and arms, says, yeah, I'll be a bit, I guess. Oh, good. He starts back to the television, and their unbroken stare... He starts back across the television, and their unbroken stare... He starts back across the television, and their unbroken stare when his foot gets caught on the controller cord. So... I'm not being pedantic here, right? Yeah. That's not worded right. Yeah. There, and here's the difference between... I also don't know... Okay, so I'm assuming it's Reggie, because he's walking. Yeah, Reggie, he's Reggie is the he. I, from, and he goes over... They're playing a lot of pronoun games. And they're unbroken stare. Like, describing Marty as a dirty look from his roommate also requires a lot of inference. Mm -hmm. And it's confusing. And you don't want to spell everything out, because that's incredibly boring, and it seems a little... Autistic, for lack of a better word. But there's a difference between confusion and intrigued. For example, I'm intrigued by what's going on with the criminals in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, they haven't explained anything with them, but I understand that's a specific intent. I am a little interested in these dudes and the drug dealing. Yeah. I am a little interested. Intrigued. And we're not supposed to know, so that's intentional confusion. Mm -hmm. But the year? That kind of bothers me, and especially mm -hmm. the ages. Bang. The remote flies out of Lonnie's hand. Right, wait. Is the controller a remote? I would assume so. Because it's on a controller cord, and then the immediate <coughs> action afterwards is flies out of Lonnie's hand. Well, oh, uh, I think you meant the gaming remote. Is that a term? I, I, I don't think it's like a, like a term people use a lot, but that's what I'm assuming is the gaming remote. Yeah, because otherwise, if I didn't know that, which is uh, fair. I might think Lonnie was so angry he threw the remote control for the television up in anger. Reggie catches himself from a total wipeout, but still gets a laugh out of one of the boys. Or out of the boys. <laughs> I'm sorry. He scurries from the room. At least he's good for a laugh. Before the door shuts. Take your time with that load! <laughs> the boy's laughter seeps out until the door fully closes. So I guess it is a soundproof door. Soundproof doors. Welcome to our college, where we put your plaque, your name, on your dorm room door. Well, it's State College in the Albion dormitory. And we also have soundproof dorms. Is Albion a pun? Albion? Like, I'll be in my dormitory. <laughs> Reggie throws his hamper as he waddles down the hall. Or, throttles. He turns the corner toward the laundry room, just in time to watch a horde of girls stampeding toward the exit. Mm. The girls wear formal attire, cocktail dresses and the like, along with heavy layers of makeup over their acne scars. Sam Peeting makes me feel like they're all, like, rushing towards the door. Well, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that verb because it's a colorful verb. Okay. I mean, 
That's just what I'm all <laughs> bunch of girls. Yeah. <laughs> Samantha hangs in back of the group, bow legged in her high heels, bearing a resemblance to the newborn to a newborn giraffe. Aww. So here's a question. Samantha is that girl who was changing in front of the window. Was she acne was she particularly acne scarred? I don't think so. Yeah, so, but from context, this is an acne scarred girl. Why? Well, because she's in a group of girls that have makeup over their acne scars, which implies that Does Samantha. Does that they have makeup over their acne scars? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I think, uh, I don't know. I feel like that's. Hmm. Because, like, when I read that, I feel like it's more like these girls are just not as pretty. Well, then you, you know? might want to say and that... And so, like, the makeup is more caked on as opposed to, like, just, like, normal. Maybe. But if you want to set up Samantha as a love interest... Right. Like she is... Right. Like, Samantha might look out of place. She might have the natural look, or she might, you know, be a, a swan among ugly ducklings. Mm hmm But I just feel like that's sort of lazy description on Samantha, and it really relies on me remembering that she, the girl who was changing, was named Samantha. Mm-hmm. Reggie spots Samantha's keys on the carpet. As she struggles to crouch for them, Reggie steps in. He grabs them for, for her. Thanks. Probably could find that sentence. He's frozen with a creepy smile. She returns a look, albeit more normal, before catching up with the girls. She doesn't return his creepy smile. They both smile, but he's awkward. <coughs> Cut outside. Let's, uh, let's do a page of this without commentary, and let's see if it flows. Mm -hmm. The decked out girls make their way toward the parking lot. Anthony parts his blinds for a look. Jesus Christ. What talent. What is it? Uh, some shit that will blow your mind. They keep playing their game. The girls' sweets, the girl suite suited up to either suck cock or rush a sorority. <laughs> Maybe both. So I guess it's early in the year. Yeah. Lonnie and Marty shoot for a look out the window. You weren't kidding. Lonnie's point of view? Samantha stumbles in her heels to catch up with the group. I like her dress. <laughs> Marty, you're so gay. Well, uh, is it... <laughs> <laughs> the voice I picked isn't really the author's fault. <laughs> that was, I'm sorry, that was me being an ass. <laughs> Marty doesn't really seem In Missouri, you can still say gay as a pejorative. If you're in California, <laughs> shameful. Yeah. I am not down with that. Anyway, sorry to offend. It's a soft bigotry of casual homophobia. <laughs> sorry. All right. Anthony says... It's all good for uh, it's all good for the lie that she's DTF. I bet she's never worn a dress like that in her life. Daddy's little gal gone rotten. I'm already sick of these assholes. Oh, the four thugs are back. Oh yay! The four thugs from the Bronco occupy a booth isolated near the back of the establishment. Balled up burger wrappers and water cups filled with soda occupy the table. No one has a phone on them, right? The other three boys nod. I don't need the cops pulling our cell records if they catch our scent. Uh, we're 100% analog. Good shit. How are we supposed to address each other in there? I'm guessing you don't want us using our names. Could, uh, could do colors like, I'm assuming that should be like, we could do colors like Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah. we could do colors like Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. You got the next line. Uh, President Mast like Point Break. It's on Obama! <laughs> You look more like Hillary to me. Fuck you, Parker! Uh, my brother does have shades of Hillary, doesn't he? And fuck you too, Jake. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I like that. This is that a funny, funny exchange. That was funny. Like, I, I'd much rather see these guys going through the specifics of planning a crime, although being, you know, dumb bros, than I would having the douchebags in the dorm room who are dumb bros behaving stereotypically and commenting on girls... Mm -hmm. Leaving, I don't know. Chandler comes. We're not doing colors or rubber masks. Not only is that shit fake, but it's unoriginal. And this plan is anything but unoriginal. It's first initials and ski masks or pantyhose, whichever you got. <laughs> what are we supposed to do about our first initials? That's a funny joke, but do we know that... It requires me knowing that their names are Jake and Jamie. So that requires a lot of inference. Yeah. Jake's number one, Jamie your number two. Might as well call me Mr. Shit. Keep hassling me and maybe I will. And know that you're getting number two because you're being a whiny little bitch. And I'm Mr. P and you're Mr. C. <laughs> I like Parker. Parker taps his plastic water cup on the table thinking. And the plan's unchanged? Just like we went over. 
And what about the drug dealer? Caesar, it's his lucky day. We focus on him, and for everyone else, we're grabbing cell phones, laptops, cash, and anything of value we can find. We move quick, and we're home by midnight to keep Mommy happy. Will any of them put up a fight? <coughs> Reggie slides quarters into the washing machine. He presses on the coin drawer to start it up. His cell chimes again. That's weird. Okay. Okay, so... Jump cut. I feel like there's too much description of the girls leaving. I feel like perhaps the Peeping Tom bit is unnecessary and doesn't play well with the meet cute later on in the hallway. And I feel like the Caesar character is, if this, given that, all right. <clears throat> From context, I understand that these are four criminals who understand that Caesar is a drug dealer who they want to rob so they can get money for PlayStations and such. Mm-hmm. From context, I understand that, or from what's been shown, I understand that Caesar is in the same dorm floor as main character and his friends, or his douchebag mm -hmm. enemies. So what I'm guessing is it's going to be something like Die Hard or Masterminds, which is Die Hard in a prep school. <laughs> Have you seen it? Patrick Stewart plays a bad guy. Mm -mm. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I get that we're setting up a diehard thing, but I feel like this is inefficiently done. I feel like the bad guys are spending too much time discussing their plans. And I feel like we've spent too much time in setup. Mm -hmm. Because the ordinary world is, this is, what's the guy's name? Which one? Reggie is a, a lovable loser who gets no respect from his roommates. Or his roommate and friends. Mm-hmm. And he's an innocent bystander in an ordinary college dorm, which happens to house a wealthy drug dealer, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, super interesting. Yeah, and these guys are going to come in and take everyone hostage. So he's going to probably die hard, prove himself, get the girl, and win the grudging respect of the men who used to shine on him. Dun dun. Yeah. Stay but tuned. I feel like th this is not a great use of the first 12 pages. I feel there's really good character-based humor in here. But as far as the story goes, I just say I want to get to it. So let's uh, skip ahead to Reggie's room. We are now on page 25, so things are underway, which is good. I like that things are going underway. Jamie and Jake bicker while tying up the boys. Let me hold the gun. Okay, so they busted in and are yeah. tying up the dudes in the dorm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fuck you. I already got it, and we're not doing this again. The captives stare at the two masked thieves. We'll end up putting a hole into one of these boys instead of bottom of the car. I'm holding the gun, and you're trying them up. You're tying them up. Marty and Lonnie eye each other as if devising a silent plan. Fine. What am I tying them up with, smart guy? Question mark. Jake looks around the room. How about their shoelaces? Dustin raises his hand like a kid in class. What the fuck do you want? I don't have laces. Who's Dustin? New guy, I guess. <laughs> the stoner lifts his foot and one, showing his, one of his van slip-ons. Jesus Christ, kid. What about the controllers? Mm -hmm. Good use, uh, period. Jamie nudges the N64 uh, controller on the ground with his toe. <laughs> See, that's why you're the one tying them up. You're a pro! <laughs> he, he yanks the cord out of the console. Now hop to and start tying these assholes up. All right, assholes, take off your shoes and pull off your laces. He sees them eyeing each other. What the fuck was that? Hey! He kicks Lonnie's leg. What are you trying to pull? Nothing. And you better keep it that way, otherwise you'll have something else to pull. Otherwise else... <laughs> Lonnie, oh. Let me go down. Lonnie's brow is fur. He's <laughs> <not> fun. <laughs> what would we give them to pull? A bullet out of his fucking skull. That was a little vague, wasn't it? You know what's funny? This is a fucking great joke. I do like But he's that. sort of acknowledging the same stuff we were kind of busting on earlier. So I feel like this would be funnier if the other jokes were, like, crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the what initial should we have <coughs> is uh, kind of vague, too, because it's, uh, it's also a, a, a vague joke. <laughs> so let's skip ahead to... Uh, I'm, I'm interested enough to see where this goes, but let's skip ahead to 32 or... Let's go to 40, which should be well within the second act, when we're really going to see what's up, because right now we're still setting up. Laundry room. Reggie backpedals into the wall opposite the door. His hand smothers his panic breaths. 
He slides to the floor. A different dryer continues to run, setting a low hum. The hallway light seeping in beneath the door flickers. Chip hugs the toilet in the handicapped stall motionless. The door creaks, followed by dual typo, squeals over the tile. Jamie drags Caesar's corpse toward the shadows, the showers. Blood soaks through the sheet and smears a red streak on the floor. Good visual. What the fuck are you doing? More stuff. Uh, who the fuck is that? Uh, There's a lot of choreography here that I don't really feel like reading. So I feel like this is a little over-described. Um, they that, take the body and they throw it in the handicap shower. That heavy bastard's Caesar. The dealer? Former drug dealer, current corpse. What happened to him? He attacked the wrong guy. <coughs> Parker stabbed him to death. Holy shit. I know. <laughs> We're not murderers, Jamie. He squats down, hyperventilating. We, we, we gotta get out of here. I know, dude, but we tagged along and now we're in the thick of this shit. It's pretty fucking serial. <laughs> I really like Jake and Jamie. Yes. Yeah. Jamie <laughs> tiptoes around the blood trail to his brother's side. Pull your shit together! How the f how are you so fucking calm? Because there's nothing we can do about it now. And the dealer's dead and we're accessories after the fact. Oh, I'm sorry. I just we, we switched, switched over. It. Okay, we switched. <laughs> so now they argue over stuff and... You know, this is Die Hard in a dorm room. I would like to see Jake and Jamie just do this on their own. Yeah. Like, accidentally kill a guy on their own. Yeah, I feel that's, <laughs> I feel that's coming. All right, so what do we know about this? It's Welcome Week. So from yes. the title, if we were really thinking, of course it's early in the year because it's Welcome Week. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to know more about what Welcome Week is because I don't really know much about college. Mm -hmm. I'd also like it to be clear what decade it is. Well, I feel like you... You will, like, if this was actually going to be made, Welcome mm -hmm. Week is kind of more of a visual thing. You know, you'd see, like, clubs being set up. Like, I feel like in that, that shot where we, like, when we introduced the campus, mm -hmm. you would see, you know, people handing out flyers and cupcakes and student council. Well, I'd like to see that. And then, like, once you set it up, then when the people with guns come in, you know, there can be blood on those banners or something. Mm -hmm. You set it up first so you can deconstruct it later. So that's Welcome Week. Um... Not bad. D don't hate it. Uh, really good comedy in there. I just the plotting feels pro forma. I kind of know where this is going. Mm -hmm. The comedy does make getting there a lot of the fun, but I feel like the setup is just unnecessarily vague, and it really mm -hmm. burned off a lot of good work, goodwill. Because when the characters are talking to each other, they're very funny. Yeah. And this person does character voices very well, but the ambiguity in the beginning just suggests that he knows everything about these people but hasn't saw fit to share it with us. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to be outside of the loop. For example, if we were to pay attention to a cat that was on the floor, out of frame, it would be destabilizing for the audience, because mm -hmm. to us, the cat is there, and it's warm and lovely and fuzzy. But to them, right. we're just describing it, so they're like, "What? I, I'm not engaged in this. So it's the difference between showing a cat and alluding to a cat off screen. That's sort of a tortured metaphor, but that's the best I got. Really try not to say like, because I said like a billion times in the last video. I say like all the time. Well, that so fits well with your that, ethos. I'm trying to be serious that's, and thoughtful. Um, that's just like what I'm going to like do. I hate that Becky character so. you do. <laughs> I didn't suck up. Yeah. <laughs> Grassroots! This is a pilot that was also submitted, and I'm very grateful for anyone who submitted their material. And anyone in the chat who wants to either comment on things or... I, I will pay attention to chat. Yeah, super dope. Grassroots, episode one, Know Who You Know, written by Ellis Christopher. WJ number, fine. November 29th, 2015. Everything. Oh my gosh, that's my birthday! Is it? Yes! Oh, wow. Well, there I you like go. This script. Always put November 29th on your script because <laughs> it might be Cheyenne's birthday. <laughs> so the cover page is already on point. It's on fleek. <laughs> it's lit. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Dude, your cover page is lit. Don't change your thing. Fish says, I'm commenting. Thank you, Fish. <laughs> if you feel like commenting on anything that's going on on the screenplay on screen, that would also be good. But thank you for commenting. Love it. <coughs> Television narrator. Named for the color of a stripe encircling the barrels in which it was transported, Agent Orange combined two herbicides one of which turned out to be contaminated with a highly toxic strain of dioxin. <coughs> mm. Montauk, <coughs> I need water. 
Agua, agua, agua! Montage, South Vietnam. Stock. The grainy footage spans. Four airborne C-123 transport planes spraying an immense forest below. No need for panic. Washington officialdom and chemical company executive... Oh, no need for panic, Washington officialdom and chemical company's executive... This is a hard line to read. No need for panic. Putting quotes around that would be good. <laughs> no need for panic, Washington officialdom and chemical company executives insisted at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. That takes me out of it yeah. because... I get what they're saying, but that's not how a narrator would say it in a sort of television. Type. Yeah, it'd be more like Washington official and chemical company executives insisted. Don't panic. <laughs> yeah. So that sort of takes me out of the base reality. I'm afraid my connection is too la laggy to be relevant. Don't even worry about it. Uh, if it, if it's late, just comment it on anyway, because I like seeing what I missed, and I also like to see if I said something weird or if I missed something, or if you love something that I hated, or vice versa. Agent Orange did not harm humans, they said, and so, from 1962 to 1971, defoliants wreaked havoc on, the, on South Vietnam, eradicating the tree coverage, assisting the Viet Cong in combat, as well as depriving the country of its crops. Gleeful cigarette mouth, 19-year-old drenching surrounding greenery. As the 60s wore on, those safety assurances increasingly rang hollow. Researchers discovered birth defects in animals. In lab animals. All right. In lab animals. So stuff, illustration. Opposition to the herbicide campaign mounted arm in arm with spreading protests against the war itself. In 1970, the Agent Orange spraying stopped. Before, vast, rich Vietnamese foliage after a blistered desert. I'm getting beginning fatigue in here because... This is not super fun to read. Honestly, I'm super into it because I I personally like super enjoy Vietnam yeah. stuff. So like seeing that whole montage and I really enjoy like that it's an yeah. old school yeah, type I, thing. I get like, the technique. Yeah, I so I personally am like into this. Okay. But Agent Orange's legacy was only beginning. Black. Half a century <laughs> later, it still casts a long shadow. I feel like this is over described though because I feel like you can get to the illustration of it in a page, and I'm not really seeing what the extra page is buying you. Mm -hmm. and I'll, or the extra quarter page. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're going to open with a television narrator, like make him sound like an actual television narrator, because it'd be, I'd be hard-pressed to find a documentary that said, Washington officialdom and chemical executives said, that's sort of the most awkward way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Interior, derelict bedroom, Don. With its generally depressive qualities, this square enclosure could serve as Guantan a Guantanamo Bay holding cell if it wanted to. On a foul mattress sits a wide-awake 15-year-old Brent Dean, offspring of Agent Orange. His head is slightly cone-shaped, his eyelids severely drooped. On the floor beside him <coughs> are a decaying duffel bag and backpack. This is overwritten. I don't like the, on the prepositional sentences of on a foul mattress sits, because it could just be... Brent Dean, 15, sits on a foul mattress. Mm -hmm. on the, yeah, it's a script. A, a, a decaying duffel bag and backpack on the floor beside him. And uh, we don't know that he's an offspring of Agent Orange. Or that's an unfilmable because... Yeah, that's true. From, con from context, I can infer that Agent Orange caused birth defects, and now I'm seeing someone who's birth defected. So I can make that connection, but... It, it's just... Well, I, I don't know. I feel like in just about anything you do, you see, like, you know, they kind of, like, start on a story of a dude, and you're yeah. like, who's that guy? And then it's like, that's <clears> the <throat> point. Find out. But, but we it's don't... It's unfilmable, because yeah, it's we giving don't information that in, in the... script that... Right. April 26, 2015. Unless right. you just do that for, like, you know, producers that are reading it. Maybe. You know, like... But for every producer who's like, oh, thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. There's another producer who's like, well, that's an unfilmable. I'm going right. to discard this right now. Right. And if you're going to use the narrator... But Agent George's legacy was only beginning. I feel like that would be a tighter cut-in, because Agent Orange's legacy was only beginning. Cut to Brett. Mm -hmm. uh, half a century later, it still casts a long shadow. It's kind of a low energy beginning. Smash. A glass bottle shatters off camera. Sweet, bitch! Sweep it good! The man storms down the hallway past Brent, grunting. <sighs> Hearing the feet descend into a stairwell, Brent stands and walks across the way to his sleeping sister Lou's room. While not as structurally deformed as her brother, Chloracne 
<coughs> Chloracne does scar her arms. And now, I'm going to go out of the script for a second and figure out what Chloracne is. Chloracne. No, oh, no, the sickness! A skin disease resembling severe acne caused by exposure to chlorinated chemicals. Oh. <clears throat> but you see, now my attention is not in the script. My atten And now my camera is going, hey, there we go. It's very strange. <coughs> the man storms, uh, so you don't want me to look up, to, to out of your script and go to Google. Because uh -huh. then I'm not paying attention to your script, and then I can check my email or play video games or do anything other than read this story. So don't confuse me. Well, how else would you describe that? Her, uh, you'd say her arms are scarred with acne. Would you just say acne? Yeah, because I can't. I don't know the difference between acne scars and chloracne right. from looking at it. Like right. if I'm walking down the street and I see someone with weird burns on their arm, right. I would say that's chloracne. Okay. Yeah, or I feel you. So, I guess you're Lou. Um, Jesus, Brent! <clears throat> uh, don't worry about it, some free art. Uh, I'm not actually seeing your double comments, and I definitely have wall of text fatigue, because I, I'm more interested in these two characters together, but it took me so much reading to get to that point. Sorry, he's downstairs. What you doing? What, what you doing? You okay? Yeah. School soon? No? Yeah. He just sits there. Lou gives him a playful nuggy. He just sits there. It's probably necessary. Well, get on now. Bus ain't gonna wait. He stands to leave. You a great sister. Okay. Oh. Okay. Half asleep and half puzzled by the remark, Lou looks at his <laughs> bare, scarred back as he exits her room. Still shirtless, Brent walks in between two seas of Virginia's finest dogwood trees. His dented posture is exacerbated by the heavy duffel bag over his left shoulder. The backpack over his right. This is a little novelistic, but I'm not minding it because it's he's doing it well. Mm -hmm. And it's really giving me a picture of Virginia and Dogwood, so that's cool. Finest is probably unfilmable, but that like Webble. Hearing a car approaching from distant background, he diverts into the tree line to his right. Forest. Panting, sweating, and dwarfed by trees, he looks toward Blackburn County High School, a quarter mile away. The backpack is now strapped over both... Oh my god. Um, Don't do this much choreography on how someone is wearing a backpack. Yeah, your actor will do it. Unless it's like, plot, <laughs> unless it's plot specific. Because in 21 Jump Street, wearing a single strap or a double strap backpack right. is actually a plot point and funny. This, I just have fatigue. Yeah. And, you know, with how the script goes, a lot of times your actor will know, Yeah, you know, it naturally happens. He notes two birds attempting to mate, feverishly chirping above him. He smiles at them, drops to one knee as he begins to unzip the duffel bag. We, okay, montage. Blackburn High School shooting late morning. Okay, that's another case of under describing things. Like, rather than dropping words like chloracne or a long drawn out thingamajig about Agent Orange, mm -hmm. I kind of want to see the school shooting because that's an archetypal. And that's an archetypal thing in movies. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of school shootings that are alluded to, shot around, or actually shot. So I'd like to see what's poetic and beautiful here. Uh, currently, the writers put more effort into describing the beautiful dogwood trees and what strap of the shoulder mm -hmm. the backpack is on. And um, kind of lipping over something that is incredibly visually interesting and that would probably require a lot of shooting days and budget to bring to life. Mm -hmm. Road, a fleet of rushing police and emergency vehicles. Four lifeless teen bodies outside. Oh, I, I okay, guess. Okay, so this is this is the montage, right? Yeah, but it's in a weird. It's it's weirdly spaced. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So okay, so we're just basically going stuff. through the school and seeing dead bodies of children. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Which is awesome. But we are sorry to report that two more students have just passed away. Again, that's not what newscasters sound like. <laughs> I mean, maybe they do in rural neighborhoods, but if you're going to write newscaster, it'd be better to sort of actually listen to newscasts of, of tragedies. Mm hmm And I can't write newscasters well. Yeah, they never, I don't, I feel like they never say I'm sorry. No. 
A gorgeous three-story home, outside of which Congresswoman Jennifer Paulson, Black, 39, is in a deadpan stare with a pristine Lexus LS. Uh, the leaves that the death uh, that leaves the death toll at 14, with four more wounded, including the shooter. Patrick, I'd like to revisit the small town aspect. It seems as though John, her husband, calls via Bluetooth. She's in no mood, which we'll come to find is uh, quite common. Hey. Hey, you get Thomas yet? Uh, no, almost there. She finally breaks her stare, looks at the home. Should we talk to him about it? I mean, he might be old enough. Just let me find out what he's what he's heard. Who the hell did this? Even if I could discuss it, you know it wouldn't. Uh, even if I could discuss it, you wouldn't know I'm back once. See you in a bit. Yeah. Bye. She ends the call. I'm kind of bored with that scene. Um. These kids' faces dominate TV screens with hardly any mention of their parents. Certainly, they're. Sh Jennifer turns it off and picks up and reads a yellow a yellow book already opened in her lap. Hold. She shuts her eyes and mouths something indiscernible repeatedly. Tears begin flowing. Okay. Good to go. Yeah, two more confirmed dead or something would be a good use of that narrator. Mm -hmm. She steps out. Okay, I like that she's psyching herself up to make herself cry, but that's a little abstract. Like, I'd, I'd like it to be a little more clear. Did, did you get that she was trying to make herself cry so she'd look presentable? Mm -hmm. She's pretending, or she's making herself sadder as she goes to... You think so? Yeah. Why? Because she's not saying, get a hold of yourself, you're a grown woman, you're a gung... She's saying, okay, good to go. Okay. So from context, I assume that she's... Okay, yeah. And she might not be, if I'm wrong. I would assume, just like, I guess because that's just like a normal thing that you would, like... I don't know, that she was, like, getting ready to be, like, strong, as opposed to, like, to show that she is more sad than what she really is. I'm a little confused, and the script has burned out my goodwill in the <coughs> opening two pages. Hey, Jennifer. Meredith. Emily's been updating me. Can't have the news on down here, you know? What have... Can't discuss it. You know that. I can discuss, well, what I can discuss is the certainty of me doing something about it. Do we know she's a congresswoman? Is she? Yeah. Okay, that's another thing. Oh, okay. Because the script is telling me she's a congresswoman in the side notes, but right. that's unfilmable. Even if she had an American flag pin on, that doesn't necessarily mean congresswoman. She could be an alderman. Yeah, someone needs to say congresswoman, you know, what's her last name, Paulson? Yeah. <coughs> um, How do you mean? Well, there's something broken in this country, Meredith, and need, right... Needs a comma. <laughs> there's something broken in this country, Meredith. Right now, I just need to continue speaking with the people. Governor Fowler, gathering information. Jennifer eyes the children inside, gathered, watching cartoons. Is anyone in there a brother or sister of a victim? I don't know. I, I don't think they've released the names yet. Drying eyes. Oh, put on sunglasses. Will you get my son, please? Of course. May God be with you. Yeah. Meredith walks off camera. <clears throat> Jennifer dials her phone. Damn, Jennifer is a cold, hard bitch. I like her. Okay. Her <laughs> ball of joy, son Thomas. I feel like what's interesting about her is sort of abstractly framed, because you wouldn't have had that cold hardness in mind if I hadn't right. reminded you she was right. a congresswoman. Right, yes, and that she was like, yeah. Yeah, so given how steely this woman is, and given how potentially interesting she is. I mm -hmm. feel like it's been buried in there. Like, I feel like I'm doing more work to sell her yeah. interestingness to you right. than the script is. I'm also an idiot. So. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Thomas rushes over that, and hugs that's her. That's where a name placard would fit. That's called Hack to Our Last One. <laughs> Someone is paying attention, and I love it. Um, so Thomas comes in. Oh, so this was like a, like a little kid's school? A daycare. School? Good day, mommy. Um, no, that's my voice. Good day, mommy. <laughs> um, one sec, Simon. I'm sorry. She's on the phone. Okay, yeah. so she's on the phone. One sec, Simon. I'm sorry. Hi, sweetheart. Go to the car, please. Mommy's on an important call. Okie doke. Listen, send me the names of all the dead and wounded. I need to know who I know. <laughs> I, I need to know who I know. Yeah. I need to see if I know anybody. Well, or... that's also the pilot title, so I imagine... 
<coughs> Lou assembles a jigsaw puzzle. Willa, her handicapped grandmother, unfilmable, enters via wheelchair. You seen Brant? No, Grandma, sorry. Almost five o'clock. And weird thing is, Dwight ain't even heard the bus. He may be out with that redhead boy, one of them goats. Might be. Well, go find out! The script overuses Wells, and also should put commas before said Wells. As Lou stands, Willa turns around. Put that goddamn puzzle in the box, thinking I'm some goddamn wheelchair maid. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. I feel like that's missing at least one comma. She collects the pieces as we... <coughs> Exterior Dean home moments later. Lou exits the dilapidated house, passing a rusted shed and two emaciated bull terriers. Bull terriers or pit bulls? <coughs> because a bull terrier is actually... Hang on. Because a, bu a bull terrier is like that target dog, right? I on um, a target dog. Yeah, you know, he's a bull terrier. Yeah, the bull terrier, <laughs> that's like... Oh, the target dog. Bud's McKenzie. And that's sort of like a rare and expensive dog for some rednecks to have. They might be mean pit bulls. Uh, so Jennifer again. Um, we we pre-lap, which... Pre-lap is something I like, which means you're using dialogue from the next scene in the previous. Mm -hmm. um, so, honey, what did you watch today? Thomas responds from the back seat. The kid is a meager five, but sounds ten. All boring cartoons. No one likes anything good, but I guess Phineas and Ferb is okay. Maybe TV for kids is starting to suck, though. Wow. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. You really want every line to die. <laughs> well, because I was already Jennifer and Thomas is a five-year-old, okay. and I can do a voice. Okay. And so Jennifer says, hey, hey, sorry. I drew a raccoon alligator, though. May I please see that? Bang! Out comes a raccoon alligator. Marker on paper. <laughs> Job well done, my son. Okay. Thank you. 20 kids just died, and we're doing this cutesy scene? Yeah. Like, this is going to be a big whiplash. Well, well, that's... Also, I feel like it's... I don't know, because he doesn't know, you know? And, like, I feel like that's something... Like, when you have young kids like that, that's something you have to kind of... Some free art actually uh, specifically praised the uh, Redneck Grandmother dialogue, because I... I you know, I grew up near a trailer park, and I had a friend who lived there, and uh, yeah, that that's, it seems in keeping with yeah. sort of that strong, yeah. you know, redneck. That's grandma. why that's why like the wells don't bother me because yeah. where I'm from, that's we say well a lot, just like we say like and uh. Well, and it still doesn't have a comma because it's in yeah, it, yeah, grammatically it's still incorrect, but like I don't know, socially, well is cool. Jennifer's <laughs> phone vibrates. She pulls over, scans names. Um, what's wrong, mommy? Was was Nathan there today, honey? Yep, he had M and M's too. Was he picked up early? Mm, yeah. Is he sick? No. She sighs, turns, and places a hand on his knee. Now I am only able to tell you this because you're a big boy. You're right. Serious face. Serious face. Nathan's brother may have been in a in a bad car accident. Jake is hurt. I'm trying to find out, sweetie. All right, so ten pages in, what's your emotional investment in the script? Um, I like it. Okay. I, I, I do. I'm kind of, I've already kind of lost track of the stuff before. Well, with the we Agent got Agent Orange, Orange and all that stuff. I've already kind of lost all that, but I really like the the redneckish characters a lot, and I really like this Jennifer woman. Well, uh, ostensibly, the redneck kid, Brent, is the one who did the school shooting. Okay. And we're going to have to deal with the ramifications of that. Dun dun. And I don't... I'm, it's sad enough that this poor half-witted redneck kid who was, you know, probably made fun of because he looked funny and wore his backpack weird mm -hmm. went on a shooting spree. I don't know what tying this to Agent Orange buys us. And also, if this is a badass character who's a congresswoman, I'd like to see her actually stated as a congresswoman. By way of example, if you're using the radio announcer, what you could have done was, and now uh, a statement from congresswoman. Or to Jennifer, congresswoman. Jennifer. Whatever. She's doing everything in her power. Yeah, I'm doing to, everything in my power. Or yeah. she's going to visit the school. Right. Or, yeah, something along those lines. And right now, like I feel like there's just way too much Cutie Thomas. Yeah. 
and you're giving a lot of dialogue to a character who, being a child, can't shoot many scenes. Mm-hmm. Because that's a practical thing. I just realized why grassroots seems so familiar. I gave it 2,000 words of notes over PM to the author. It's nice to see another person agrees with my thoughts on it. Please tell us more of these thoughts, because I will confirm them if you want, and it will save me from reading stuff I don't have to read. Also, kind of reminds me of um, the book by Jody Pickholt. Um, what is it 15 minutes? Yeah. Or 13 minutes or whatever. It's got a real soulful southern 17 gothic. minutes. It's got a real soulful southern gothic kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. Like, I get the structures of power. I like when Jennifer said, it's real backwoods. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is going to be a, a drama carried by talking. Yeah. And the dialogue is just not on fleek. Yeah. Like, an actor could make this work, but you're not, you wouldn't be excited to bring this scene in for your scene study class. Right. That's, yeah, that's true. And if you're playing in the terrain of Sorkin and Mamet, then I'd kind of like want the dialogue to be more alive. Because this is dialogue that has to be enhanced by an actor, not dialogue that would enhance an actor. Mm hmm. They approach an ICU, stuff happens, mommy's job. Dit, dit, dit. <coughs> Finally, we go to an old farmhouse where Lou knocks on a door. Inside, a mother peering through a window asks her teenage red haired son, Troy, who is this? The hell? Uh, Lance Brandt's sister. He moves to the door. She promptly reaches out and yanks his shirt collar. Outside, Lou hears a scrambling. Hello? Troy? Boy, don't you dare. She could be part of it for all we know. She gives one final knock, waits. All right, then. Y'all have a good one. I feel for Lou because she's kind of half bright. Yeah. It's a sad, sad scenario. Birth defects from Agent Orange. Poor Lou. And now she's got to deal with the fact that she's going to be shunned by her community. because So this the bones of the story are there. But I'm not sure. Like I'm not seeing Pilot here. Yeah. Like, this could be a movie or a short story. That's what I was going to say, a movie. That's what it feels like. This definitely feels like something like The Sweet Hereafter, a, a small community dealing with tragedy. Mm -hmm. feels a bit like Crash because you're seeing people from all different uh, backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses um, dealing with each other. Mm -hmm. But right now, unless you have a school shooting every day, like, this feels very premised. Right, yeah. Interior basement, Dean home, early evening. 65-year-old Dwight Dean, whose cratered face we now actually see, uh, stands glued to a 13-inch box television, wearing only underpants. This is not a face and body of mere old age. Skin patches ranging from ghost white to Florida orange stain most of his upper body. Hmm. Like a dog being spoken to, his head... Okay, this is all very novelistic. Okay, now now she's being a congressman. Let's see this. Mm, Interior yeah. ICU evening. Jennifer scans the dozens of distraught <coughs> visitors until spotting a shell-shocked Marsha Woodward and her husband Paul, the parents of Thomas's friend. Eek. There are so many unfilmables. It's like a Game of Thrones level of characters. Mm -hmm. Her friend, or the, the, the son of the thing. And I can't see that unless you show me a genealogy. This needs to be expressed in dialogue. Like, right. Congresswoman, thank you for coming. I'm so sorry, uh, your son. Like, I, I know yeah. he's a friend of your son. But if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Some of our conflict was weak with local officials later on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Angelo Lorenzo writes, My big issues were overall flow of information, like you mentioned. We don't get a clear idea. Uh, Jennifer is a congresswoman. I also felt some of her conflict was weak with local officials later on. The other thing is, by making this, this isn't really about Agent Orange. This is about a community. Right. And this would have happened if there was lead in the water or the boy was beaten. Or if he just saw violence glorified in the media. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is a story about a community that's been affected by violence. And the Agent Orange is sort of adding Vietnam boomer stuff to uh, this mythology to try and mythologize it more by tying it to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But it sort of takes the piss out of it because, A, there's a reason. The boy wasn't to blame. We don't have to think about any of these societal causes. It's Agent Orange. Right. Uh, you want to give a whack at this speech? Excuse me. Hello, everyone. Pardon me. I will be very brief. Some of you probably know me. I'm Jennifer Paulson. I'm your Congresswoman, 7th District. I will be present in this ICU as much as possible, 
with you all in support and prayer. If you need anything, please approach me. I want to, please approach me. I want to apologize on behalf of your government, my government, for this atrocity. My best to all of you. Now imagine you had, I don't know, who's, uh... I think that line should be, I want to apologize on behalf of the government, your government, for this atrocity. There's this amazing movie, uh, City Hall. It's kind of bad in places, but I always liked it because I, I really liked it when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And Al Pacino plays a mayor. And it's a lot of Al Pacino making speeches. And when you get a guy like Al Pacino, you want them to be good speeches. Mm -hmm. And right now I read this speech, and it feels like it could have been written by SpeechBot 3000. Like mm -hmm. Anyone with a communications degree could have written this speech. Well, I feel like it's... Yeah. I, I almost feel like it could be shorter. Yeah. Because... Or, or longer. In like. Well, she says she's going to... Keep it brief. Yeah. If it's if it's going to be pretty yeah. and fluffy, it needs to in be the, longer. In the New Testament, they talk about fallen angels and standing in this ICU with these brave children struggling for life. I now see what they meant. <laughs> That's yeah. a little much. No, but she's a Southern congresswoman. <laughs> something right. it would give her some personality. Right. Because right now, the speech suffers in comparison to something that someone could improvise. <coughs> I've, some free art says, I've been trying to figure it out, and I think I found it. The intro sounded like the beginning of the A-Team, but didn't really follow through. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> like, the only reason I would use something like the documentary setup for Agent Orange is if it was either about Agent Orange, or if this was called Revenge of the Orange Men, where Agent Orange infected mutants mm. uh, are attacking people, and then you kind of like need that justification, too. <laughs> So she. So speech could be stronger. Yeah. Take yeah. it in a super For some specific reason, we're direction. We're on don't news be about bolt terriers, and I don't want that. So mm -hmm. let me just add a source. Oh. I'm still figuring out my screen capture screen clip thing. <coughs> For those of you who don't know, I'm a little sick, so I'm just like spitting into a, a sack. It's so sexy. <laughs> Super sexy. Okay, uh, amidst light mumbling, she moves to the woodwards. Marsha's eyes remain glued to the floor as Paul consoles her. Paul's wounded eyes glance up at Jennifer's. This boy who did this to Jake, what's his story? Work in progress, Paul. Under a setting sun, Lou passes the hospital, noting the unusual abundance of cars in the parking lot. I... Is there anything I can I could do for Nathan? Is there anything for Nathan I can do? He can stay with us, with Thomas? Paul, astoundingly resolute, looks to his statue of a wife. Just gonna step out with Jennifer, okay, honey? He whispers something in his ear, then stands nodding at Jennifer. A lot of choreography. So he doesn't know. We're a bit unsure how to explain to a five-year-old that his brother was shot at school. Jesus Christ. Where is he? Home. My mother's with us for a bit, remember? Right. So is Jake responsive? Do you know how many have passed? Fourteen, last I heard. Frankly, I've not even... I, frankly, I've not even looked at my phone in the past. Paul absolutely crumbles, sobbing. He falls into Jennifer. Mm -hmm. She... <coughs> she can't see me like this. She can't... Pl please forgive me. Interior Jennifer's car, a horrified Thomas looking on, cut to black. Dwight has a white knuckled grip on Lou's hair. Oh, uh, I don't, I don't know, sir. I only seen him this morning. Look here, look here. What the fuck is missing? Uh, your Winchester, sir. And so is your brother. Find the faggot. Deafening silence as Jennifer and Thomas drive home. They enter to find a nervous John, Caucasian late thirties, on the couch. Hi, guys. Long day. Yep. Can I go to my room? Yes, honey. What happened? Nathan's probably going to lose his brother. Dear God. The story is, and will be, that he was in a car accident. I don't know that Thomas would be able to even fathom what actually happened, so that's our narrative. Do not fuck that up. <coughs> in fact, don't speak of it. I will soon be... <coughs> Sorry, guys. 
and do not fuck that up. In fact, don't speak of it. I will soon be, in, uh, be thrust into the beaming spotlight, and I cannot have distractions within these walls. All right, so now they're, the script is <coughs> not about the, re the reaction of a community to... Jennifer just, like, turned real fast. Yeah, and... I feel like she was like, It's about oh God, covering everything. it up to her child. I, I'm not getting Jennifer. She makes these long speeches, and they're not terribly interesting, and I can't see this attracting an actress. I, I really like the idea of her being, like, uh, like a hard bitch. <clears throat> or something. But as if she's going to be a hard bitch, I don't want her to have a kid. You know? Like... Or if she's going to be a hard <clears throat> bitch, I'd like to see how her being a hard bitch informs her being a mother. Yeah, well, and... And then I feel like she's, and maybe it's just like, I don't know, it's like weird termage, because I guess you can be a hard bitch and still be a mom, but then that, that's like a, because uh, right now she's very aggressive strength, and I, if she has this like great dynamic with her son, I want to see that softened a little bit mm -hmm. into like a softer, more she's subtle. She's just a strike. money character. Like she's a little generic yeah. when she loves her son, and she's a little generic when she's being a politician, and she's right. a little generic yes. when she's being hard. Maybe that's the point, though. Maybe, maybe Jennifer's a robot. Well, rather than talk about whether she's a robot or not, let's see if we have anything else in the inbox. But where the script lost me was when it didn't do anything interesting with the Agent Orange setup, and. Uh, when all the long blocks of dialogue sort of feel pro forma. Because if we just put on serious voices and just do, improvise, we can do things like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Honey. That's true. Your brother is dead. No. Yes, I'm afraid he died in a car crash. <laughs> He's with God now. It's just generic yeah. stuff. And given that this is the writer showing off everything uh, that they can do, <coughs> every... The way, the way I like to think of it is, if I were to give an assignment of a writing prompt to ten writers, and the writing prompt was, it's about a congresswoman who's a mother, who's hard but a good mom, and is dealing with the school shooting in her community. Show off what you can do in one scene that encapsulates this. Like, you'd want every writer to put their style on it, even if they were writing that exact idea, which is a sort of a stock idea. You'd want it to be styled. You know, Quentin Tarantino would do it one way. Robert Rodriguez would do it another yeah. way. Aaron Sorkin would do it another way. And every writer needs their own voice. They need to do it in a way that is specific to them. And right now, I kind of feel like the interesting choices are in the Agent Orange stuff, but they're not really being played to the hilt. Right. And then all the interactions are stock. we got stock grandmother, stock bad father. Yeah. Everyone is pretty stock cliche. Stock hard congresswoman. Stock precocious kid. <coughs> <clears throat> like, I know you have fun doing the voice for uh, for Thomas. Yeah, no, he's not super interesting. And also, if you have a kid who's five years old, who's half black, half white, who can do a serious role in a prestige drama, that's a rare beast. Like, that kid's going to be in demand because every pilot's going to want him. Right? <laughs> so it's unlikely to lock that kid into this. So either do less with the kid, because he's not going to be young and cute long, or do more. Let's see, what else we got? Of these two scripts, Shy, do you see like any? Do you see anything in common with these two pieces of material? Um, what was the first one? <laughs> oh yeah, the the shoot the guys. Oh look, here's some live commentary. This is stupidly fun to listen to. Not somehow, it just is. <laughs> I'd love to send in a script, but I'd, I want to revise it again first. Yeah, but please send revise it, it in. because if you're going to inflict it on me, please make it easy for you're me. You're going to inflict it on me? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. <clears throat> like when I was younger. In about 2003, I had this really old Pentium computer, and it had Minesweeper on it. And I played Minesweeper all day long. This is before web casual games. It was just fun. You know, you get cracked out on Minesweeper. And it's the dumbest possible game. There's no visual stimulation. There's nothing. <laughs> but it's fun. It, it takes my mind off my problems and gives me a feeling of accomplishment. I was also reading scripts for a big agency at the time. 
And there were times when I did not want to read the scripts. I wanted to play Minesweeper. But think about that. These are things people have put six months of their lives into, things that they want people to invest millions of dollars into, things that they want to entertain people with. Mm -hmm. And I would rather stare at a wall <laughs> or click on fucking bricks than read these scripts. That's true. And it's so glaringly simple. We are writers. We are entertainers. We write to entertain. And if it's boring, you've fundamentally failed. And I hate it when... I'm not saying any of these scripts have done that. But the, the common problem is people forget that there's another human being on the other end. Um, some free art says, We're a few minutes in and I'm learning about massive mistakes I make constantly. Hearing someone read and give commentary simultaneously is an amazing tool for figuring out your shortcomings as a writer. Mm -hmm. And exactly. The reason why I'm doing this live, we're not cleaning it up, we're not reading it in advance, is I'm showing you exactly how information is received. We have things in our mind and we encode them in a communication. It could be a written word, it could be a sentence, it could be a song, it could be a dance. And then that communication goes and gets decoded in someone else's brain. Mm -hmm. And as atomically simple as that is, for whatever reason, in the heat of battle, we just forget. Like, I make this yeah. mistake all the time. Like, I'll spend six months working on some story and the, my friends will be, Matt, you just forgot to put the jokes in. This is an interesting. <laughs> like, why would any human being choose to spend their afternoon with these characters? Right. Yeah. What I'm doing right now is I'm trying to find another script to read. <clears throat> yeah, both those scripts feel like they have a lot of fluff. And, like... More so in the, like you said, the stage directions yeah. than, than anything. And the way you avoid this fluff is you can do this yourself. You can actually take a voice recorder or your iPhone or uh, your computer and just read your own script into mm -hmm. it. And if you get bored reading it, imagine how I'm going to feel. Right, yeah. It's actually really hard. I'll often take one of my scripts and see how long into the read I can get. Like, fade in. Me, Jack, 15, black. He's running to... I'll see how far I can get in without just hating myself, hating the script, hating the world, and wanting to change everything. Mm -hmm. And hearing it out loud and playing it back for yourself is a good tool to show if it's boring or not. Right. Yeah, because you never know how something sounds unless it's <laughs> said aloud. So, gonna go to Reddit. For whatever reason... For whatever reason, this... Stream is eating up so much bandwidth, I'm having trouble actually opening up another script. So I apologize for that bad planning on my part. Oh look, we got some comments. Yay! Some free art says, They both made me uh, realize my character descriptions are beyond weak. While I did it to give a director freedom with casting, that can be changed later, and just hurts <coughs> immersion when, while reading. Well, it's not necessarily character descriptions, because I don't want to see... Right, there's a difference between seeing, like, um, guy, Caucasian, 20s to 25, buff, has a six-pack, arms the size of this, brown hair, grayish-blue eyes... Like, that's different. But I would like to see an age. Yeah, an age. And, if it and some t Yeah, it, like, For which example, most of the time it does matter. To be, if we were on film, we would both appear to be in our mid-20s. Right. Or, or early to mid-20s. Right. I'm older, but it doesn't matter. Right. And if she was a 16-year-old girl sitting next to me, it would automatically be weird. Because even if she was doing the same stuff... Right. The, your question in your head would be, why are you hanging out with a, an underage girl, man? Right, exactly. And if that would... That would be funny. Like, it'd be yeah, like, if I was 80, yeah. that would be, you know, also, or, it would kind of be like, why is this old woman? Or if <laughs> you're like, obviously dude? my mom, that would also be funny. But <laughs> right. you, you can't write around that. So it's not so much you need to, like, give every detail in there. Because I feel like in uh, the second script, in the pilot, they do a very good job of giving every detail. But, uh... Mm -hmm. It's just too much. It's yeah. Enough, enough. It... Even though... Jennifer was described, she didn't behave as such. Like, if she came in hard, like, every line's like, don't fuck with me, I'm a strong, independent woman, fuck you, or the Lord has a plan for us, and I believe in that plan that the Lord has mm -hmm. given us. Lord, Lord, yeah. Lord, Lord. 
anything she does informs her character. Like, as you've seen, through our behavior, you get the feeling that Cheyenne is a little goofy, and I'm very analytical. Yeah. <laughs> and a bad, a bad script would be like, Matt is very analytical, and then have me talk exactly like Cheyenne. Right. Whereas a better script might have me just doing my analytical bullshit. Oh, here we go. Thank heavens. Thank heavens. Um, Matthew Young, back to Welcome Week. Full disclosure, I'm the one who wrote it. Thanks for the notes. Uh, you're welcome, Matt. And if you think we were unfair or we missed anything, um, I apologize. But like I said, uh, I, if I hope you caught this. I thought you did character stuff very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Jack and Jamie. Or Jake and Jamie. Do you do, do, you do improv? What's your, uh, do you have an acting background, Matthew? Tell me a little bit about where that comes from. I don't know if you guys saw my shirt, but it's a bunch of cats with Santa Claus hats on. It's festive. Where did you get that? Target. Men's section. I think the problem with buying things at Target is because there's so much Target stuff, you're going to see someone wearing your exact same thing and you might not like that person. No, that's fine. No, because I know, I may not like them as a person, but I know they got dope stuff. <laughs> so what's going on in the world of 20-somethings? Is there any more dope slang you can give us? <laughs> We're insane. Insane lit, fire, insane lit dope. So we get some options here. Here's a link to one of my scripts. I don't mind if you use it for your show. This is called Marked. Let's <coughs> see what that looks like. <coughs> and we also have a 25-pager drama sci-fi. Mm. Or we could just go to our Read My Script and see what's on there. Rick and Morty. I have a big Rick and Morty fan. Oh my god, I'm so into Rick and Morty. <laughs> so into Rick and Morty. Have you seen the second season? I have seen the second mm -hmm. season. I was writing a script about a fantasy kingdom, you know, and in that episode where they go into like the microverse, they mm -hmm. did a couple jokes I wanted to use. It's oh. like, no! <laughs> and it's got an eight month lead time too, so I knew, like, obviously they wrote the jokes before I did, but I was just so pissed. It's always disappointing. Like, no, I thought of that first! Let's see. What's that called? Parallel thinking? Yeah. Well, they say, like, human beings spontaneously develop fire at the same time in human history. Mm -hmm. It just, they all just had the same idea. Why is this not working? Because it doesn't want to. This really doesn't want to work. It's terrifying. We're having technical difficulties. Some free art, you totally have my seven pager. Uh, some free art, send that to me again. I didn't download it before, and so now I'm having trouble pulling it up. But uh, if you email it to me, I, I, I swear I will do it next. Homeboy says he doesn't have an acting background. Just trying to be smart ass, I guess. Go to the ending. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure it's good. It's what, what I think you do incredibly well is you do. Uh, you do character stuff well. And there's two kinds of jokes. The first kind of joke is, why is this happening? Mm, yeah, it says I'm using my, uh, what is it? Uh, free art says that they're using their dialogue and action as a crutch. Yeah, I could see that, using action as a crutch. Well, that's what's called an unfilmable. There's two, the, it's two kinds of problems. The first problem is called on-the-nose dialogue. Yeah. Like, on-the-nose dialogue is sometimes a necessary evil. <coughs> but that goes like, Cheyenne, as you know, we've been friends for about six months since we met on that movie set. Mm -hmm. And in that time, we've had the... That's boring. But you would need to know that because that would inform how we know each other. Because mm -hmm. right now, in the back of their mind, they might wonder, are we friends? Did I hire you for the evening? Are we lovers? Mm -hmm. We're not, you know. Right. And... Yeah. Full disclosure, we're not lovers, so... Not for lack of trying on her part, but um, <laughs> Not for lack of trying on my part. <laughs> Alright. We're going to Mark. Silent Bob! Is that what that said? Yeah. Silent Bob! Obviously, this is a Reddit thing, and he doesn't want his real name out there, so, you know, I'm not going to make fun of that. Oh, Sir Silent Bob. 
exterior. Already, I feel like this font looks a little weird. It might be because I'm just in uh, Dropbox, but I feel like this is a kind of a thin font, so it makes me wonder, mm -hmm. was this written in Final Draft or Celtics? And I'm not saying Celtics is a bad program, but I'm saying that scripts that look like they were written in Celtics have always disappointed me. Mm -hmm. Exterior, Cedar Grove High School parking lot, afternoon. Okay, why is there a comma after parking lot? Theoretically, that should be a hyphen or a double hyphen. So already, this is off to a bad start. School is just lot out, and... Oh. Words. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. School has just let out, and students are leaving the building, ready to enjoy their weekend. Outside, typo. The school, <laughs> a large blue banner hangs with the words, Homecoming tonight, should be capitalized, written across in... Bold white letters. Just a reminder to students that we will still be having our homecoming dance tonight, despite the events that occurred earlier this week. We will, however, have upgraded security at this event, and once you come into the building, you will not be permitted to leave until the end of the dance. Thank you, and go Blackhawks! All right, there's so many typos in this first one. Just go through and Re, like I guess look at the script typos. All the other thing is, what the hell? <coughs> I'm not even going to note the typos anymore, but just know that there are so many typos here that it's incurred my ac actual animosity. <laughs> and it makes me feel like if the writer didn't give a shit, why should I give a shit? And I'm right. sure the writer is a nice human being and a good person who's worked really hard on this. But it just communicates so poorly. Yeah, that's true. No, like, I mean, I... Yeah, because even if you have a good script, people will get through, like, the first, literally, the first, like, quarter of a page. And as soon as they see typos and that it's in a weird font or, like, whatever, whatever, it's just like with a resume. You know, if you have a typo in any part of your resume or if it's in a weird format or whatever, no one's going to even think about Well, the metaphor you. I like to do is anyone who you want to read your script, who's got the power to hire you or change your career in a, a meaningful way, is essentially a really, really pretty girl at the bar. And everyone wants something from them. Most people kind of bore them, and they only have so much to give. And for, the, for that pretty girl, she just needs to filter out s people somehow. And even if it's completely arbitrary and superficial, like right. she won't date a guy with a mustache, exactly. she won't date a guy with shoes, or yeah. with bad shoes. Right, I won't pick a script where yeah. the guy doesn't use a fucking hyphen after <laughs> <laughs> this description or a young Carter works. exits the back door of the building and makes his way to the car, passing other students. <coughs> As he's about to open his car door, Gwen shouts after him. Carter, wait up! Carter stops and waves as Gwen hurriedly makes her way across the parking lot to Carter, right too much choreography. Hey, Gwen, I thought you were riding the bus today. Nah, I decided to get a ride with you instead. You don't mind, right? I figured if I got you to drop me off, I could use the extra time to get ready for homecoming tonight. Of course I don't mind. I'm sure your dad won't be too happy about it, though. Stepdad. And he can just get over it. I'm practically an adult. And I can, and I think I can make, my, the, uh, make the decision to ride home with my boyfriend if I want to. Well, I'm not going to complain. Get in. So they get in the car. Uh, radio play is settling on a popular 90s song. Ooh, I love this song! Of course you would. Uh, I don't make fun of you for your taste in music. I mean, seriously, ACDC, Van Halen, um, how old are you again? Hey, Nap, don't diss the rock. You know, I'm really surprised they're still going through with the dance tonight. Me too. But poor Jenny. I heard they found her body with that heart, <laughs> with her heart ripped clean out of her chest? All right. You know how the principal earlier alluded to, like, horrible goings-on? Oh, my God! <laughs> like, this is just misframed, because either show, show don't tell, right? Mm. What? Okay. I either have the heart ripped out of her chest to begin with, and, like, do the cold open, or, like, give me the context for this, <laughs> because what's fucking hilarious is, I'm just gonna, like, be a principal planning, uh, I'm going to be principal planning a dance, and you just keep reminding me that a girl just got killed by having her <laughs> So, Cheyenne, I, I think we should get some solo cups for the party. I think they're pretty festive. Oh, uh, Jenny died. Yeah, 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 but the DJ, like, um, I, I think that he should keep the music kind of upbeat, a little, a little poppy. I don't want too much slow dancing. And she had, like, when they found her, her heart was completely 
ripped out of her body. I acknowledge that that was an unfortunate, unforeseen And there were tons of straws poked through her where they were drinking her blood. Look, I know she was your sister, but Cheyenne, you're on the party planning committee. We're t- the, the dance must go on. Right, but, I mean, Jenny was your valedictorian. That was sad, and it will... Yeah, like, that is absurd. <laughs> you want to, like, see that, because the, the absurdity... The absurdity of planning... The, the absurdity of not canceling the dance is actually kind of funny. But it's sort of funny in a very abstract, hypothetical way. You'd want it. No, no, Cheyenne. For God's sake. And stop crying. We're planning this party. Now, do you think we should go for the red cups or the blue cups? <laughs> stop crying. Well, and also, I think, and maybe this is the angle that the writer was going for, that sometimes when, you know, bad stuff happens, especially in a small town, you kind of pretend that things are okay. You know, so, you know, if this dance was already scheduled and blah, 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 you know, why don't we give the students, you know, a night to maybe forget about it? Well, then I would kind of want to see it, because it would be like this. Principal Havermeister, I think we should cancel the dance. No, the students need a little pick-me-up. The students are all in shock because our valedictorian got her heart ripped out of her fucking ribcage. Yeah, but maybe we could all come together. Maybe the dance won't become a dance, but more of a a kumbaya type celebration of little Jenny's life. Principal Havermeister, I know you're a a big believer in the positive, powerful thinking, but I think at this point we just need to let the students be sad. It's in incredibly poor taste. I think we need healing crystals. Everyone's chakras could be alive right now. (laughs) I don't want another letter from the parents' board. The last time you did that, everyone accused you of being a witch. You're on by a threat. <laughs> on a certain day, Mrs. Hey, Havermeister. <laughs> so that's the case of both me not wanting to give the script. I might give the script the benefit of the doubt if they had capitalized even like one I. Yeah. Like, if you look at the. F- I'm saying like a lot. If you look at the first page of that, it's actually more. It's more cap. There's more non-capitalized letters than there are capitalized letters. Yeah. I was actually shocked when she said stepdad, and it was capital S. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever streamed in this high resolution with Xtreme, and it's amazing how much this slows down my web. Mm. Like I don't know how those cam girls do it. They I don't make know. it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Your your internet seems pretty fast to me. Maybe I just like shitty internet. Well, I don't like to brag. All right, here's some free art. He wrote Bootstrap. And even though I've got stain removal up, I'm going to do bootstrap first because I promised, and a promise is a promise. And if you're ever watching this or want to... Holy fuck, that's funny. Get the <laughs> healing crystals. Oh, exactly. And I hate to fucking deconstruct a joke here, but the reason why that's funny is... The idea of a principal who wants to go on with the dance is absurd, right? And it's absurd oh. on a level that's cartoony. Yeah. But by giving her a justification, whereas she believes in powerful, uh, positive thinking, then it allows us to move off of just the absurdity of the dance... And now she's an absurd principal. What else is she? <laughs> Did she come to work in a dashiki? <laughs> Does she think blackface is okay because she's not a racist? Like what? I almost feel like that's like a like a a cartoon, like what we just read. Yeah. Like a um, well, I don't even know what's like what cartoon to even like reference it. To. They didn't ground. They didn't ground the psychology of it. <clears throat> and you always want to ground it because it's absurd. It feels like a Bob's Burgers. Yeah. Like a really like. If Bob's Burgers wasn't so normal, <laughs> that's what it feels like. Hi, I appreciate it. It may not be pretty, but the feedback will help for sure. And for sure, I mean, and this is the closest thing to a table read you've probably ever done. And it just goes to show that, yeah. like, what a creative and invested actor can do to your material. And also, if at any... I want you to do me a favor. If while we're reading this, if at any point you, uh actually kind of wince and say, oh god, I ever wrote that, just let me know. And I, It's better to cop to it, because a lot of times when you uh, when you hear your own stuff read out loud, your first thought is you do wince, because it's painful. Yeah. Anything that you create is always like, eh. <laughs> Let's get rid of Marked. But with this one, with Vermarkt, my major note is copy edit this. And also, show, don't tell. Rather than have Carter saying, yeah, did you get interviewed by those two feds? Literally just start it. It's an ordinary day at the high school. Kids are going to class. People are making out. Yeah, because then, then he hears screams. Yeah, weird guys straight out of like a film or something. 
I don't know. That, yeah, show it to me. <laughs> Some free says, every other bit of feedback I get is kiss-assery. It's either lazy or not brutal enough. Well, one of the problems I've found with um, feedback is people do tend to be a little lazy. And also people tend to be very egotistical. Well, I feel like people always try to be nice. Like, oh no, this is great. No, I mean, I, I try not to be mean, but I genuinely don't give a shit or not, like, who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're a nice person, but my concern is, is the script amusing me or not? I'm because, sure you're a shitty <clears throat> person. Well, you think that of everyone. And that you ripped that, that you did that to a girl. You're, so you're saying the author of another script cross <laughs> Oh, I did. I thought it was... <laughs> my bad. I'm sure you're a nice person. Hey, look, there's a cat. Let's see if we can spam him for reading. Oh, baby. Bootstrap, Bootstrap, written by Blake Watson. Thank Concept you. by Come H. Baby. Crowther. Come here, baby. This is the cat I'm cat sitting. Hi, Kitty. He's terrible. He's really sweet. He's not terrible. At all. Okay. Int Garage. <laughs> yeah. Okay, first of all, I love that this person's name is Kellen, like a Helen Keller. Because I used to say, hello, and then you would say, Kellen. You, you lucked out with this. I don't have that strong a, a connection to the name. <laughs> that's what I, I know people. That's the, I mean, that's, you know, super oddly specific, but Kellen, that's great. Uh, you, there's already a major sort of snafu up here because you've centered in Garage Day like a act break, and that's not how it's supposed to go. It's a slug line, not an act break. Also, it's int.garage-day. Not int, you put an extra dash in there. <laughs> I'm not making out with the cat. I'm just letting it smell my breath. I'm sorry. Okay. Kellen, mid-twenties, fumbles with wires protruding from the control panel of an odd-looking device at the back of the garage. Corbin sits in a rolling chair, bouncing a tennis uh, ball off the wall. The thwack echoes with each hit. Yeah. All right. For starters, describe the garage a little bit. Is it a rich guy's garage or a poor guy's garage? Is there a car in it? Is there a workbench? Is it full of Home Depot shit? Is it hoarded? Is it in the suburbs? Is it in the city? Is it an old San Francisco mansion that's 100 years old? And also, echoes with each hit. Not only do you need not need to capitalize echo, but the, you've made it an apostrophe possessive, which you didn't mean. So, the first two lines sort of fill me with despair. You want to be Corbin or Kellen? I'll be Kellen. You almost done over there? Thwack! My wiring is fine. Your design is the problem. Thwack! Well, it's not like I can pull up a time machine schematic on Usenet. Thwack! I mean, I could, but you're flicking the switch. So I like this. Like, what I like is it's a, got a good who, what, where. These guys appear to be friends, and um, we know exactly what they're doing. So, uh, and I even like how, rather than being on the news, as you know, we're inventing a time machine. Mm -hmm. you, you coded that in sarcasm, so that was a good use of technique. Thwack. And the ball flies wide, striking the control panel. It erupts with a flash, igniting a small fire. Kellen frantically scrambles to trip the breaker as Corbin bathes the panel and Kellen in a cloud from the fire extinguisher. The cloud dissipates, showing a mess of melted wires and Kellen white and slouching. Great. Now it's broken. <laughs> it's not like it really worked in the first place. You want me to help you clean up? Corbin walks outside and returns to an unwitting Kellen, brandishing a garden hose. Kellen shrieks as the cold water covers his back. Ah! Stop messing around! That's the second time today you've almost electrocuted me! <laughs> nah, man, the break is stripped. I like that. That's funny. <laughs> That's very funny. That's not the point! Knock, knock. knock. Kellen and Corbin turn to the open garage door and see Baxter, a middle-aged man who is rather queerly dressed. Baxter, a small dog. His hammer... You take out rather queerly dressed because that, like, has gay implications and, uh... Yeah. It's, it's funny enough that he's wearing hammer pants. Nirvana His hammer pants, Nirvana t-shirt, and large hair are all comments of the period, but rather conflicting in their message. In the same sense, um... I love that. <laughs> in the same sense that, uh, you might want... That's a little abstract. You might want to call it out. Yo, Baxter, I get that you're all about 90s trends, this being the 90s and all. Like, Hammer Pants is hip-hop, and Nirvana's grunge. No, I honestly, I think it works without saying anything about it. Yeah, no, like, it, it works in saying... Because, like, me, like as someone, like, I would look at that guy and be like, What? You look like everyone from VH1 butt-fucked, and you're the resulting fashion abortion. And what's with the big hair? <laughs> I like it. 
So yeah, you might want to call that out because. Well, I don't think they know him. Or you might want to call out uh, at some point because right now you're implying a good joke here. But uh, what's funny about it would need to be explored in dialogue because you can't really sell that in the unfilmable. And also, bear in mind, a lot of people are. A lot of people have short attention spans, and they don't really remember the past real well. And as far as I know, that might have been what people were wearing back in the 90s. I'd have to look it up to check. I personally don't think you need to do a dialogue. Right. I totally, <laughs> like, I, I get it. I okay. get it. <laughs> uh, Kellen says, can, can I help you? Forces himself in between the two for a selfie. Sorry to intrude. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Baxter Curran. <laughs> I love this guy. I do too. Um, <laughs> but the, the deal is, what's also what's funny here, oh, I get it. He's a time traveler. Oh. And that's why he's wearing bad stuff, because he is a bad time traveler. He believes that this is what people dress like. Mm -hmm. So it's kind mm -hmm. of... The other thing is, he's taking a selfie. You might want to do the joke here. A, your script doesn't set up that they're in the 90s. Right. Very well. I mean, Usenet is sort of a 90s reference, but, you know, it's, that's a very... Yeah, I didn't catch that they were in the 90s at all. And B, like, um, imagine, like, if I was, like, from the future. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm meeting the Great Cheyenne. Let me do a metal cloud. You'd be like, what the hell's going on? All right. <laughs> Because, like, that's... Right. But, you know, like, presumably in the future, a mental cloud is, like, a selfie, and that's how we just do things. Uh -huh. But you would be like, what? Right. Oh, that's a yeah. mental cloud. Yeah. I forgot. You guys don't have neural net technology. So if you're in the 90s, and I'm like, you're like, what the hell? Right. What, what's that in your hand, and why did you just touch me? Right. Kellen is frozen for a minute. <clears throat> well, even if you put a log line in your original email, it's if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Like... You gotta, the script's got to speak for itself. So if you set up, it's a nice time in the 90s. You know, Nirvana's on the radio, and the DJ's like, and now with their new number one hit signal, Nirvana, a band that is alive and currently always will be alive because it's the 90s. Yeah, well, a log <laughs> line should be just um, a summary and not new information. Yeah. <laughs> like, a script should work individual, separate of the log line. <clears throat> Corbin returns to his chair and takes in the scene unfolding. His eyes cut back and forth between the melting snowman and MC hair grunge Baxter. I'm confused. Kellen. What was it you needed? Kellen turns his hand to Corbin, mouthing, help me. Corbin just nods his head toward Baxter and smiles. The camera flashes again. Ah, oh, just the man I was looking for. I'm an investor from the few. <clears throat> As I was saying, I'm an investor from Europe. <laughs> I've been following your work. Corbin's eyes widen at the word investor. He rises from his chair and joins the other two men at the door. Europe, you say? What part? Eastern. Little country. You've probably never heard of it. Anyway, that <laughs> <clears throat> This is funny. And I, I will say, I like time travel stuff. But given that this is a time travel stuff, and all the time travel stuff <clears throat> comes from, uh, all, all the jokes are coming from the fact that it's someone from, who's probably from our time, uh, going back then to the 90s, You'd want to spell that out a little more clearly so the comedy works. Eastern European? You sound pretty American. Isn't Nirvana that new band from Seattle? Uh, yeah, yes, well, you see, the, the, the thing, I, I can assure you, you'll want to hear me out. I don't know what game you're playing at here, but we have work to do. Kellen walks back toward the mess as Corbin leans against the wall, pressing the automatic door switch. All right, all right, so maybe I lied, but you wouldn't believe me if I said I came from the future. At least you're telling the truth about one thing. And I think um, that joke, I think the joke there is supposed to be, you're right, I don't believe you. But uh, that's yeah, sort of like a, yeah. a very tortured joke. Using the word truth really throws me off. Yeah. Go away, Kat, and stop being bad. I Baxter kicks the closed You're door. You're right, you crazy man. <laughs> You're right, I don't. Yeah. Baxter kicks the closed door, ripping his hammer pants at the same uh, at the crotch and fumbles out of sight. And also, the other thing is, if I told you, hey Cheyenne, I'm actually from the, the future, you might not necessarily believe me. But if you are actually working on a time machine, 
you would. No. Yeah. You would be more inclined. Yeah, more inclined. So that living room typo night. Corbin pours over a table full of schematics, skibbling, changing, and changing back. Kellen dozes in the recliner. Interior garage day. Kellen works furiously on wiring as Corbin naps in his rolling chair, uh, feet propped up on the workbench. Okay, a lot of stuff going on. I don't necessarily need this. Knock on the door. Skim schematics are shuffled a third time along with mysterious paper, and Corbin's face lights up with inspiration. Wake up! I've got it! <laughs> it's summer break. Let me sleep in, Mom. The coffee flies through the air, drenching Kellen's face. He's awake now and not happy about it. What's your problem, man? I barely slept for days. No time for that now. But don't worry. We'll have all the time in the world soon. What are you rambling on I about? I want to change it to, but soon we'll have all the time in the world. Mm-hmm. I like soon. We'll have all the time in the world. What are you rambling on about? I think I know where we went wrong. Well, someone oh. did. Try this out. He passes the schematic on. Kellen reads, face slowly transforming. By the time he finishes tracing the diagram with his eyes, it's a look of glee. He looks to Kellen, who is... Re okay, that's... A over choreographed. Like you could cut the center one line. Kellen reads several <coughs> smiles, cut to the garage. Kellen works furiously in the wiring while Corbin stares over his shoulder. Corbin paces the room while Kellen uh, replaces the cover for the control panel. Well, I guess that's it. You did the work, you do the honors. No chance. You designed it, you get fried. Kellen throws a stuffed bear into the device, did it did, um, flips the lever, cricket strip in the background. I don't understand. We should have either sent that bear to another time, or at least leveled the neighborhood. Great line. <laughs> Kellen scratches his head in confusion and begins tracing wiring through the power supply. Um, I think I found the problem. You didn't turn on the, uh, you didn't turn the breaker back on after you. A flash of light fills the room, knocking Kellen and Corbin to the ground. Every light in the house goes dark. The two men shake out the cobwebs rising through their feet. Only the platform where the bear on the on the platform where the bear once sat stands three men in odd attire. <laughs> Again, this is a case of prepositional bullshit. Three men in odd attire stand where the bear once sat. <coughs> also, you want to stretch out what odd attire is because you've already showed uh, Baxter in odd attire once. What are they in now? With kimonos? Yeah. Are they in like weird, like superistic stuff? Miss, Mr. Karen? Superistic, futuristic. You seem surprised to see me, Corbin. Did I not say we had urgent matters to discuss? So it worked. But why did it send you here? We were trying to send that bear somewhere else. Oh, Kellen, my dear boy. It didn't work in the least. Man 1 retrieves a stuffed bear, charred and still smoking from behind Baxter. I just needed to make a point. Well, go ahead then. They stare, wide-eyed jaws agape. Kellen attempts to speak, only a guttural moan escapes. Oh, very well. As I tried to explain before, my associates and I are from the future. <laughs> Baxter motions toward Corbin's trusty chair and takes a seat. He leans back comfortably and nods to Man 1. Although you gentlemen are strides away, you will be the first to facilitate mass time travel. The reason you're strides away comes down to funding, plain and simple. We'd like to help you solve that problem. You mean to tell me we're actually going to make this work? We're just goofing off here. If Elon Musk can make it back to his home planet, I don't think you will have much trouble, given the correct support, of course. Wait, Elon Musk is an a Ailey? How old is Elon Musk? I don't even know who Elon Musk is. Elon Musk is the guy behind Tesla cars. He's sort of like a modern-day Edison. But I'm, I'm not sure that in this time period they would have known who he was, because people didn't start hearing about Elon Musk until, like, 2006. Looking at you, some free art. <clears throat> oh, that's neither here nor there. The point is, we know you accept your offer, and we know the agreed amount, and we know that time is the only thing of consequence in this business. Now, if you'd be so kind as to look over these documents... Baxter stands to join Man 1 and 2, who are busy laying a hefty contract across the workbench. Corbin and Kellen still stand frozen. Well, gentlemen, we don't have all night. Unless you get this thing working on your own, of course. <laughs> Oh, is that the end? Yeah. That's the end. I like that. It's cute. That's my favorite <clears throat> one of the day. I really like that one. Well, shorts are easier because shorts we can get the whole picture, and shorts you have less time for pussyfooting around. Yeah, but honestly, <clears throat> like I, I, I thought this was just like a, a first, like a not a first draft, but just like a draft of something, I guess, bigger. I would actually love to see this expanded over something. 
Well, there, it's got two ways to go, because as a short, I feel like this could be down to about five pages. Or mm -hmm. less. Yeah. Because you could say, like, all the schematic stuff in the beginning, and then rather than have him kick Corbin out and bring him back in and have the other associates, like, um, let, let's do it. Like, uh, you're killing. You don't believe me? I'm from the future. What can I say to convince you? Um, you I don't know, man. You'd have to show me something. In the future... You marry a transvestite who has a badger tattoo. Bro, you be tripping. It's your darkest fantasy, don't lie. <laughs> Corbin, that's not yeah. true, bro. That's not, that's not and, true. And Corbin, you yourself have always been shaken by the death of your sister. But it turns out, she's alive. What, my sister? <laughs> you are not playing along very well. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I can tell you, you know, I can. T I know that you have had a lifelong dream to own the Philharmonic Opera. In the future, you do. <gasps> I never told anyone that. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more. <laughs> then we will say goodnight <laughs> for the night. Can I go pee? Is sure. There an opportunity? Could they go pee? Yeah, it's uh, right over there. Right over there. In this. In this bag. <clears throat> All right. I'm gonna potty break. Yeah. You can't. As some free art acknowledges that he screwed up his timeline on Elon Musk, and if not everyone likes time time travel stuff, but the people that do really like time travel stuff, like I do, and um, don't 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 mess with that because it kind of takes me out of it. Like it's enough of a suspension of disbelief that time travel exists. So don't do the one choice that's going to alienate the core audience for said time travel material. So closing out the night, we have Boring Lampshade with a 25-pager. If you want to read over a drama sci-fi, which I do. If I do this in the future, I'm definitely going to have the scripts ready to go beforehand because waiting for them to load is painful and annoying, and I'm sorry to subject you to it. Because it's frustrating from my end, but it must be really boring to watch me stumble over technology out in Internet land. Oh, man. Oh, Fish, this is yours. Um, t uh, 1236. You want me to go over um, 12 to 36? If I'm streaming from high res, my laptop might be stressed when coding, therefore Chrome slows down. And yeah, that'd be neat, maybe it's mine. Alright, Fish, from uh, what I want from you is, um, I want you to give me a sort of story so far, because if we're going to drop right into page 12, uh, we're going to miss a lot of stuff. And uh, the second thing is, uh, would this be faster in, uh, would this be faster if I did this on Microsoft Edge or Internet Explorer? So he wants us to read from page 12. Cool. <coughs> yeah, it used to be that Chrome was like the good one. Like, what? Are you old fashioned? Are you stupid? What are you doing using Internet Explorer? And right. Now, like, everyone is discovering all these terrible Chrome leaks on apps. Yeah. And I think Microsoft Edge is actually becoming better. Like, I'm actually hating myself for using Chrome. What is Microsoft Edge? It's Microsoft Explorer. And, uh, Microsoft Explorer was so damaged. This isn't going to work from page 12 because I've got no idea who Tizoni or Riranga are. Did you say Riganga or Regina? Is it Regina? No. <laughs> I didn't see how it was spelled. Would that it was, but it's not. Oh, okay. All right. 
12.36. That's not what time it is, but the name of our movie. Well, maybe it's in December of 1936. Oh, wow. It's just not working the way I want it to. Black. Is the color. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. <coughs> out of the darkness, a speck of white light flickering, growing. It forms a tall, boxed outline around a figure. A young girl, no older than 13. She's in a tightly confined space. She wakes. Some grime on her face is lit by beams of light, shining through a grill on the door. A coat falls on her head. The light flicks away for a second before returning. Bang. The door crashes, followed by a feminine voice. I'd like to know what she's wearing and what time period we're in. Hello? Hello, is... Oh, you, you guess it's you. Hello? <clears throat> Hello, is there someone on my boat? Listen, I don't know who you are or who, how you came to be here, but if, if, if you're not there, uh, but if you're there, then you better come out right now, mister, and, and keep, them, keep your hands where I can see them. She doesn't move. The light vanishes again. Almighty righty, then. I'm opening the door, and I have a gun, so, so, so don't try anything. This takes a long time to read, and I don't think it's got the payoff you perhaps want. The grill swings open, half blinding the young girl. I think grill has an E on the end of it. Standing in the, her wake, a young woman, slim, capitalized that, messy red hair, knotted with a rubber flexi seal, about 20 years old. This is to zone. So, this is Zion. I'm going to say Zion. I don't fucking care how it's pronounced, but it's Zion. Zion. <clears throat> Hello there? Oh. Hello? Who are you then? The young girl shakes her head, herself confused. Cyan uh, lowers the gun, stepping back into a small spaceship cabin. Oh, so I'm Cyan? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, uh, I, I guess... Yeah, I guess you're Cyan and I'm girl. Okay. That's weird. Okay. Um, yeah, so when we introduce that feminine voice, should we introduce that as Cyan? Um, it might be... Given that it's confusing, and given that like we are actually having this moment, you are well within your rights format-wise to call her feminine voice than Cyan, mm -hmm. but it just adds a lot of hard work. I don't know, it confuses me because there's the two girls, yeah, you know, I'm just, uh, so it, it makes me think the girl that we opened up it, with. It makes me think about shit I don't want to think about, Yeah, I hate thinking about it. I genuinely hate thinking about shit. Mm, shit. Uh, that's something at least. Are you going to hurt me? No. Then you can come out of that locker. The girl steps out of the locker into the spacecraft. It's cozy, a bunk bed, single cockpit, small table, fashioned as a girl's possessive, slightly messy work room. I'm Zoni, or Zion. <laughs> do, do you have a name? Yeah, the noob is accurate. Mystery is good, confusion is bad. No. Uh, can't you say, and it should be anything? Can't you say anything well, but she's, she's yes a and no? Can't oh, you say nothing, she? but yeah, we're, I guess we're reading her as folksy. Okay. Yeah, it's like, I'm for shooty rooty tooty gonna come out of this door with a gun. You know? Okay, I just kind of thought she was like, What are you doing on my girl? boat? Because especially because, well, I guess if they're in the future. I don't know. Okay. So, um, can't you say nothing but yes and no? Yes. Great. So you're a nameless kid who can only giggle and say yes and no. Yes. So, where did you sneak on? Port, par, uh, Pratchett? Look at you. You're such a, you're as brown as a nut. Okay, you suck on that poor Pratchett, and somehow I've I haven't found. Whoa. Okay. Okay. You snuck on poor Pratchett, and somehow I haven't found you until we're out in the middle of nowhere on the way to a slightly less nowhere. Fantastic. I couldn't have sworn I I could have sworn I threw a jacket in that locker just last night. I didn't sneak on at poor Pratchett, and he did. Hey, look. There's a jacket. It wasn't in there. I wasn't in there last night, if that's any consolation. How'd you get in? Uh, how'd you get here? I don't know. Were you there for long? I don't think so. Are you cold? Yes. She pulls a jersey. If she's cold, just put on the jacket. Jesus Christ. Like, she can't really be complaining about coldness. If the very means she needs to alleviate her <laughs> coldness is literally in a locker with her. Yeah. <laughs> 
right. I like the setup. I like the mystery of this. But I f and I feel like Zion's dialogue is a little overwritten. I like the fact that she's a folksy space captain. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not sure if you're a Firefly fan. Mm, I don't know. Well, in Firefly, they're sort of like badass gunslingers. Uh huh. Uh, but they happen to fly starships and such. In Firefly, they are badass gunslinger, old west archetypes, mm -hmm. but they happen to be space pilots. Right. So I'm space cowboys. I'm fine with this. This is a little bit like Space Dandy, which is an anime, etc. I have a name. But I don't know what it is. Well, that's helpful. I have to call you something. You can't just say, hey, you, uh, for the duration. Zion is being very cool about this. Yeah. Like, but, um, but then again, I almost like, I feel like she would be. So they go through a whole bunch know. of names. <laughs> Ashanti. What can I call you? R Riranga. Riranga? So it was, the girl is Riranga. Uh, funny name. All right, Ranga, it is. Are you hungry, hungry, Ranga? Yes. She walks to a small cluttered table, leaning over to an open cupboard. She pulls out what looks like a plain white microwave meal. Here, it's self-heating. She makes space on the table, placing the meal down for Ranga. Just rip off the top and eat. She sits. She eats. <coughs> okay, I kind of feel like we're five pages in right now, and I wish more had happened. Mm-hmm. Because it's weird that she doesn't know her name. It's weird that she said yes or no when she didn't. It's weird that she didn't put on a jacket. And I kind of like... Like, I kind of want to see something like... Now, girl, you got real lucky with me. Because any other space captain in this fleet would just shoot you out the porthole. Mm -hmm. But I am a God-fearing woman, and you seem like a, a harmless little pack. Right. So I'm just... I'm happy to offer you my hospitality until I can kick your ass off at Port Arthur. Yeah. Something, because otherwise I'm wondering, like, why is she so cool about a stowaway? Because that's bad. <laughs> also, like, if, if it's a spaceship, there's finite food and oxygen on that spaceship, so a stowaway could actually cause real trouble. And the other question is, now, you sure you didn't bring any of your little friends on my spaceship? I don't want to die of hypertosis out here in the deep void. <laughs> hypertosis. <laughs> So they keep going. A lot of choreography on eating, which I'm not... So she pulls out a red fo uh, folder from a pile of paperwork on her desk, flips through it. Here, in case of unforeseen visitors. <clears throat> Welcome to my spacecraft. That's the Star Striker. I'm your captain, also pilot, co-pilot, mechanic, security guard, medic, general, deckhand, my and General Deckhand. My name is Zion. I hope you enjoy your flight. Star Striker? What does it mean? Uh, it's derived from starstruck, meaning impressed or dazzled, you know, by the glorious galaxy. <coughs> Alright, so I kind of feel like this was a waste of seven pages. Because, like, if, if you could, like, the, the, the beats of the scene are as such. If I'm, if you're the girl, and I'm, uh, and I, I'm, uh, the captain, it'd be like, I'm looking around. Wait, holy shit, a stowaway. How'd you get on? Are you alone? Yes. Are you gonna hurt me? No. Well, anyone else would kick you off the ship, but I'm not because I've always wanted a daughter, or I don't believe in that, or someone, I stowed away once, and someone saved me. So I'm going to offer you the same courtesy, but if you step out of line, I will light you up with this blaster. You got a name? Yes. Make one, yeah, okay, no? <laughs> no? Fine, fine. Make, make one up. Your name's Ruranga. Ruranga! <laughs> Alright. And you can do that, like, in a few pages, because otherwise it's seven pages, which is the equivalent of two TV scenes mm -hmm. of nothing. And also, if this is a pilot, the ordinary world might be... I'm Zion. I'm a badass, you know, space pilot who doesn't need anyone and, like, is succeeding in a man's industry. Right. No, shit, I don't know how to do that maternal stuff. What? A stowaway? So we see who she was before this. Because right now you're conflating your inciting incident with your ordinary world. And it's all too drummed together. And the reason why that's good is, or why that would be better, is you're losing the human element. Because you got all this Star Striker and paperwork and oxygen and Port uh, Pratchett, which is a cool Terry Pratchett reference. And you're 
because it's all sci-fi and sci-fi has a limited audience, you kind of want to open it up. Because at the core of it, what this is, is not about showing off the cool spaceship you've done. Right. But it's about finding the human connection between the two characters. Mm -hmm. So... We were just talking about that the other day. That's why uh, gravity didn't work and interstellar worked. Mm -hmm. Was gravity looked... The reason why people thought gravity was so good was because it was pretty. Yeah. And not because, like... <laughs> <laughs> the script was such, so shitty. So I, I like the concept of it because I like the idea of a mother daughter who are on a space freighter having mm -hmm. adventures. Yeah, and I like the idea of this like southern yeah. space cowboy or kind of a lady. Hick. Like we yeah. made her southern, but she's a little folksy, which I get. Right. Um, I kind of feel like at at twenty seven pages, this is, feels like an animated pilot that doesn't have enough jokes to carry it as a half hour. Mm -hmm. So I there's something here. The idea of a mother daughter quasi team having space adventures in a world that's so stereotypically male and macho mm -hmm. is cool. Be like uh, Leela from Futurama had a kid. Yeah. I, that, or that adopted mean, an orphan. Yeah, that would like, be an acceptable she spin -off. was also an orphan. I feel like a James Bond villain whenever he shows up. <laughs> yes, Mr. Script. I will comment on you. So cute. You're just so precious. I just want to take you home. You want to? <laughs> I do. <laughs> didn't, I didn't I try and sell you this cat when, uh, when we first met? I don't think so. Oh. Okay, anyway. <laughs> well, if my friend neglects to pick him up, he's all yours. No, I already have two cats at home. I think that's what you said when we met. <laughs> so, I, I feel like this is a, a promising concept, but it starts way too soon, and if you put in 10 pages of Ordinary World, you'd be bumping this up closer to 40. It'd feel more like an hour long, and uh, be a better showcase for your uh, hour long pilot skills and make it more hireable. Because people write pilots with the hope of getting them on the air, but most of them don't make it to the air. Most of them serve as resumes or entrees to writer's rooms where you get hired to write someone else's show and build your TV chops. Um, and I feel like this is losing <coughs> the human element in the spectacle of it. Uh, and the way to reconnect with that is to make it more clear where Zion is coming from and also consider giving him names that a reader can pronounce because Sione and Rirenga are just like a real tongue twister challenge and if someone was on the fence about sci-fi it might Turn Which I'm off. totally on the fence about sci-fi all the time. But I like this because of the relationship. Well, that's all the time. But, yeah, but I need <laughs> needs more. <laughs> no, more. Yeah, it needs more soul. Needs more soul, yeah. Well, this, is, uh, this has been fun. I think we've read some good scripts and mm -hmm. some scripts that need a little bit of work. Yeah. And uh, if we take anything from it, it's consider your audience, look for typos, and just give us a clarity. My understanding is like a hungry little dog that wants to be fed. And if it's fed, I'm like, oh, cool. Also, uh, one thing I noticed in a lot of these that we've acknowledged is um, the over-describing of actions. Because, mm -hmm. like, when it comes to things like eating and, like, uh, you know, like holding a backpack and a duffel bag or, like, whatever it is, a majority of the time your actor is going to know what needs to happen based off of context of the script, the beats of the script. Mm -hmm. And like if it's if it's a well written script and it's getting made, the beats are already gonna be there. So I don't have to you don't have to explain you don't have to that cho I choreograph common actions. But if hypothetically a prom is going on despite the fact that a girl got her heart ripped out through her chest, mm -hmm. you might want to describe that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So it's not under-describe everything. It's not over-describe everything. Well, yeah, it's I mean, like, with actual physical actions. Like, a lot of times your actors are going to know what's up. Well, Fish, I'm sorry if that was more brutal than you uh, you hoped for, but that's my God's honest opinion, Where, and I hope it was useful to you. Um, overall, thank you for everyone who submitted scripts. This is the first time we've ever done a show where everyone, every script came in via the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any yeah, uh, sure. more questions, uh, you can send them to my YouTube channel. Or check out my website at www.thestorycoach.net, and I can do I do notes for a living, and I will hopefully help you <coughs> develop your writing craft. Until next time, I'm Matt Lazarus. Um, yeah, I might see you next time. I don't know.